as lifelines, restoration and protection of fresh water in Europe. This event has been uh, brought together on the occasion of the EU Green Week and also the World Fish Migration Day 2020. Um, and it's been co-hosted by the Nature Conservancy and by Wetlands International European Association. Um, as I just mentioned, my name is Chris Baker. I work for Wetlands International Global Office, where I have been leading, or I am still leading, our rivers and lakes programs globally. Um, I'm a wetland expert, if you like, going back some 30 years. I had an academic career, and now I've been with wetlands now for some 20 years, trying to bring science into policy and practice. I'm also a former member of the European Centre of River Restoration, so I have some familiarity with the issues related to European rivers and wetlands. Now, great we have so many people here. Today, we are really uh, looking at uh, rivers and uh, their restoration, conservation across the whole of Europe, um, really marked by the fact that we have now uh, the, a water framework directive that has passed through its health check and ready for a renewed energy of implementation and that we're all also fast approaching confirmation of a new biodiversity strategy in the EU, which also addresses and sets targets for rivers across the continent. And so really, I think the purpose of this event is to have a little bit of a reflection upon where we are in terms of river conservation and restoration, uh, what opportunity we have, what tools, and how we move forward from here. And hopefully by the end of the day, we can pull out some key conclusions, uh, directions of travel that we need to share beyond the participants in this particular meeting. Um, I'll just quickly run through the main blocks of the program. So we'll start shortly with a scene setter, if you like, three short presentations talking about the current situation for freshwater in Europe. We'll then reflect a bit more deeply upon the pressures upon freshwater in, in the region and um, why they should be protected. We'll then look in particular at the European Union legal frameworks, the state of them and their suitability and how they're useful and we'll combine that with a panel discussion reflecting on some real cases. We'll take a lunch break. And thereafter, we'll move on to looking to more practical tools for river conservation. Uh, and then we'll take a particular focus upon a region outside the EU in Europe, the Western Balkans, which has its own particular context. It has a number of really European level significant rivers that merit better protection. And we want to look at really how this is interacting with the opportunity of European approximation, but also the risks that that poses as well. And then from that, I hope by the end of the day, we'll be able to pull some key conclusions uh, from the discussions as a way to go forward and take our agenda forward. Um, I'm joined here, and you can't see her next to me, but by uh, Ave Silver and also by uh, counterpart in TNC, Henrik Osterblad. These we three will try and uh, make this as smooth and uh, good flowing an event as we possibly can. Um, I'll be moderating the event, so helping you through the program. Um, for speakers, hopefully uh, you'll be able to keep the time, but I'll have to try and keep you the time if you overrun. And then if we have um, rather more technical issues, then Aif and Henrik are there to help. Um, there are a few simple rules, of course, on these sorts of events, typically. Um, Aif will, in any, in any case, I believe, be able to mute all of you. So those of you who are not speaking, please keep yourselves muted. You have the option to leave yourself visible or not in terms of the video. That's up to you. Um, now, of course, with this sort of online event, um, open questions and discussions are not so easy. So what we want, would like you to do is where you have questions or issues you would like raised, please put them in the chat box that you will be able to access uh, in the Zoom. You see that at the bottom of your screen. And then Henrik is going to moderate these. And um, when the moment presents itself, he'll share some of the key questions uh, that have come through. So, if I think I'm looking at Henrik as well. I think we're more or less ready to roll with that short intro. Yes. Okay, then I'd like to move to the opening session, if I may. That's uh, the current situation for freshwater in Europe. We have three excellent speakers to give you some opening statements. Um, we're planning to take these really one after the other. So, as I said, if you have comments, please um, put them in the chat box and we'll try to pick them up towards the end. The first speaker is going to be Urena Lorenzo. She's the head of Office of Wetlands International Europe. She's a passionate nature lover, if you like. She secured a degree in biology at the Complutense University of Madrid, and has a master's degree in environmental management. And she's associated herself with various nature conservation initiatives and organizations across Europe 
through her career, uh, most recently working in the business development activities of BirdLife Malta. So I'd like to give Urena the floor, please. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, really thrilled to uh, see all of you who have Urena, we can't us. hear you. You cannot hear Sorry. me. Can you hear me now? You can? I, okay, good. Okay, you're right, sorry, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so good morning everyone and um, thanks for being here. I'm very happy to see you uh, all, the of you uh, that have joined to, uh, us today. So um, it is no news for us that we are living in challenging times and uh, many citizens and organizations have called out for a green recovery from the current crisis. Wetlands are disappearing and being polluted at an alarming rate. And despite being fundamental ecosystem service providers, they have played the role of unsung heroes for too long, often not understood due to their dynamics or their dual nature of water and land. But it is not only their natural values what matter, they provide these unique resources and inspiration to humans. And among ecosystems, wetlands are also a barometer of the relationship between people and nature. But there is a long way to go to restore this relationship. And the time is now to reset our mindsets and to act. So if we look at the situation of rivers, we see that they are one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. And in Europe, this, is situa this situation is not any better. So rivers are increasingly disconnected due to dams and hard infrastructure, meaning that few, uh, few rivers are still free flowing. Furthermore, over one third of Europe's freshwater species are threatened. So amidst all these negative trends, there's still hope to switch directions. The political will is awakened, our citizens are now more aware than ever of the challenges that we are facing and the European Union possesses the urgently needed policy instruments to protect and restore our rivers, notably the Water Framework Directive. This directive has proven to be successful when the properly implemented and enforced, yet more actions are needed to bring Europe's freshwater ecosystems into good health. Also, the European uh, Union Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, which was presented in May by the European Commission, recognizes the role of healthy ecosystems like wetlands and proposes targets for restoring river connectivity. So this is a big step into the right direction and it is the task of all of us to ensure no further delay. We are in a critical moment when the scale and the urgency of action is of the utmost importance. We must reinforce our efforts to protect and restore rivers and the species that depend on them with stakeholders. And by safeguarding and restoring freshwater ecosystems, we can improve human health and well-being but while bringing many other benefits like rebuilding society's resilience and enhancing biodiversity. So this is no longer about saving nature, this is also about saving us. As Wetlands International Europe, we raise awareness on wetlands status, trends and values to reframe the importance of European nature policy and to highlight the need for greater implementation and enforcement. We point up the need for increased investments in conservation and restoration of European wetland ecosystems. And through our advocacy, knowledge development and communications activities, we stimulate greater deployment of nature-based solutions as a means to improve the European policy, water policy implementation. And we don't do this alone. So we highly value the power of coalitions, of alliances and partnerships, and that's why 
in the future and the near future, Wetlands International Europe will continue working with the European Commission, the European Parliament, member states, stakeholders, and our members to improve our joint efforts to achieve the objectives of the Water Framework Directive. So thank you again for being uh, here today. I look, look forward for in-depth uh, discussions on these topics today and in the coming months. And I really believe that uh, we can improve the situation of wetlands and of rivers and all species and of all these species that depend on them, ultimately connecting people and nature for the benefit of all. So thank you so much and enjoy the, the webinar. Thank you very much for these uh, opening comments, Urena, which we'll take with us throughout the session today. Without, without further ado, I'd like to move on to our second speaker giving an open statement. It's with great pleasure we're able to welcome Per Holmgren, uh, who is a member of the European Parliament uh, from Sweden, representing the Swedish Green Party in the Green Party Group in the Parliament. He's a full member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, and substitute member in the Committee on Transport and, the, and the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development. So, Per, I believe you have some opening uh, words to share with us on the current situation for fresh water in Europe. I, I give the floor to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I actually would like to, to start by quoting what you said, uh, that your aim is to try to bring science into politics and, and practice, and I guess that's my aim as well. Uh, being a scientist, uh, meteorologist, uh, climate expert, uh, I've been working with climate climate change for at least some 20, 25 years now. And, and uh, uh, that's really been my main focus of, of getting into politics as well. I, I joined the Swedish Green Party two years ago, and now I'm, I'm a, as you mentioned, a full member in, in, in MV and also uh, substituting in Agri. And of course, all these issues uh, affect um, so much in our society. Uh, I'd like to, to start with just uh, stressing uh, something that w you are all probably aware of, but I still think that uh, a lot of people out there in, in society that may not are aware of the fact that we're, when we're discussing climate change, global warming, we usually focus on the temperatures. And of course, if we would get a two degrees warmer world and then probably three or four degrees warmer here in Europe, we could hopefully adapt to that higher temperature, but it will be much, much harder to adapt to, to changes in, in, in the hydrological cycle because what happens now when uh, the climate gets warmer is that the, 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 the speed of the hydrological cycle um, accelerates. So mainly we will get uh, more droughts in, in already dry areas and, and more water, more precipitation in, in already uh, wet areas. And although uh, the main parts of, of Europe couldn't be considered as extreme dry or extreme wet, maybe uh, with the uh, uh, maybe apart from, from south of the Mediterranean area during the summertime, of course, which is really dry. But then it'll uh, rather be that we get more precipitation when we have precipitation. The, the, the rain showers during summers will be much heavier. And also periods of droughts and, and heat waves will be more severe. And, and of course, all of this will uh, affect uh, every, everyone and everything uh, here in, in Europe. So, uh, everything concerning climate adaptation, uh, resilience, uh, biodiversity, etc., uh, is is so important, and and it, it's it's time now that we don't think that these issues is something that we let's say can just uh, discuss in in the envy committee. It, it needs to be more or less the, the the ground for for the basis for all the politics in within uh, the European Union. Uh, before I joined the parliament, uh, for a few years I was working in, in, the, uh, in the biggest insurance company in, in Sweden and, and there I often said that uh, uh, well-working nature and especially biodiversity of course with 
well doing ecosystem services is the best insurance company that we can have in our society. And uh, let's face it, uh, the, the freshwater biodiversity is really threatened here in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, and at the same time, of course, healthy and, and resilient freshwater ecosystems are, are much better to, able to mitigate the effects of and uh, also adapt to, to climate change. Um, uh, currently, I am a shadow rapporteur in, on a file related to climate change uh, adaptation, and this is something that I, I, I really, really want to, to stress in, in, in that work. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, climate change is having, and, and already is having, and will be having an even greater uh, significant negative impact on, on freshwater sources and, and, and droughts. And one of the things uh, is uh, that it will lead to, to high risk of, of uh, depleted river flows and, and high concentrations of pollutants. And, and, and then on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, with more intense rainfall, that will also lead to a risk of increased urban and, and agricultural runoff. I, I will return to agriculture in, in just a while. Um, and then also the, the increasing temperatures in themselves will lead to, to more increased uh, water stress, uh, which will impact the environment and, and uh, also many, many economic sectors. Uh, and then as, as we all know, maybe especially the certain coastal zones uh, will maybe not already this decade or, or the next decade, but, but certainly during this century, they will be come on under great pressure due to, to rising sea levels. Um, and, and once again, when we're discussing rising sea levels, maybe we mainly think about the, the seas rising and then threatening buildings uh, infrastructures near the coastal zones. But uh, one of the main problems, and, and that is a huge problem all around the world, is, is the intrusion of, of saline water and also extreme weather with, with severe uh, hurricanes, storms, uh, etc., which can push uh, the seawater well into uh, not only cities, but also very, very important agricultural areas. That is often um, cited uh, near rivers and, and rivers, delta areas, rivers outflow uh, in the seas. Uh, and just to sum it up, uh, next week we are voting on, on, on the CAP, which is of course one of the most important uh, topics here, here in the European uh, Union when it comes to, to budget. It's almost roughly a, a third of the total budget and, and uh, here we really, really need to, to acknowledge the fact that we would need to uh, really change quite a lot when it comes to agriculture in, in the European Union. I mean, just for one thing that uh, agriculture stands for roughly 40% of all the water use in, in, in Europe. Uh, and once again, with, with the change in the climate, we will have uh, probably in quite a near future, quite severe uh, threats to especially the agriculture in, in uh, the Mediterranean area and in the south of Europe. Um, that's uh, the most important things for me, but I'm, I'm looking forward for, for a discussion as well and, and some questions and answers later. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to you, Per, for, for such a great uh, overview and really putting the issues regarding climate on the table as part of this discussion as they relate to our wider environment and rivers as well. Um, without further ado, I'd like to move to our next speaker, Hans Stielstra. Um, I, I see just before you start, Hans, I introduce you, we're getting still more people joining, which is really great. I have now nearly two pages full on my screen. So just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions or issues you'd like to raise, as we're going along, please post them in the chat box and uh, our colleague uh, Henrik Osterblad will uh, help me to moderate these and, and share them as we want. So without further ado, moving on to Hans Stielstra, uh, who is uh, Deputy Head of Unit for Water under DG Environment. His background educationally is in political science and environment and he's taught business organization and worked for consultancy before joining the commission in 1988. 
there he's undertaken a range of jobs before he's now uh, landed in his current post. So um, Hans, we're looking for some further perspectives on the situation facing rivers today from the Commission's point of view. Thank you for joining and I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to, uh, to join you. Um, uh, and, and pleasure in general that uh, there's so much interest in um, in rivers, uh, and I think rightly so. We we heard from uh, from our colleague uh, Jurana, the first speaker, that uh, uh, waters are one of the most endangered uh, ecosystems, um, and, um, and 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 that they are essential for biodiversity. Well, uh, they are clearly essential for uh, many other <clears throat> functions in society as well, and and this is what uh, what we're trying to. Uh, bring together basically in the in the water framework directive, which is the uh, the piece of legislation that that I am responsible for, along with with a number of colleagues. Um, in Europe, we have uh, one point two um, million kilometers of rivers, uh, at least rivers that are regulated by the by the water framework directive, and. Um, uh, I'm, 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 I will be speaking principally from the perspective of this water framework directive, but <clears throat> of course it's not the only policy um, that is relevant to rivers, nor is it um, the, the, the only um, uh, perspective that we should look at. But, uh, but anyway, that's the, the main thing I think that I have to bring to this uh, discussion. Um, so from the perspective of that legislation, the most uh, important thing that we're trying to achieve, of course, is to achieve good status for uh, that 1.2 kilom million kilometers of rivers uh, in Europe by, by 2027. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and the only way in which that could not, um, that it is still legally possible for rivers uh, not to be in good status after 2027 is when so-called natural conditions uh, prevent that. So if there is a set of natural conditions that prevent rivers from having good status, it is still okay to go beyond 2027. If not, we really expect member states to, to do their homework and uh, to, to do their utmost and, and achieve that rivers are in good status uh, by then. And also, it's important to keep that in mind, the Water Framework Directive also asks that there is no deterioration of status. So once the legislation is in place, uh, and this is an obligation that applies since 2003, uh, deterioration of, of water quality is no longer uh, acceptable legally. Um, but good status means more than just uh, the continuity of, of rivers. Huh? It, it, it also means that the rivers have to be, um, uh, chemically speaking, in, in the good status, uh, that the flow levels are right, that the biology is, uh, is up to standards. So it's more than uh, simply, and, and I, I, I have to put simply here between inverted commas, removing obstacles, uh, it is much more uh, that is required actually uh, in order to bring rivers into, into good status. And the last count and the last official count that we have um, for rivers is 2018 when the agency, the European Environment Agency produced a report. Um, rivers were at around 45% uh, in good status, so there is still a huge um, implementation gap, if you like, or at least there is a huge uh, effort still to be made in order to arrive at 100%. Um, now, in all fairness, I think today we are at a somewhat higher level. I mean, the figures that I just quoted were published in 2018, but they probably um, were uh, dating back to something like 2014, 2015. And we know that a lot, a lot, a lot of activity has taken place meanwhile in the member states. So uh, we, we do expect the figure of 45 to be uh, a fair bit higher um, uh, meanwhile, but we unfortunately have no way of, of uh, knowing that for sure. But it's only realistic, I think, to expect that it's higher. If you would focus on, um, on, on the rivers, what is exactly causing the problems from our perspective on rivers? 
it is uh, in 24 percent of the cases um, it is a matter of um, um, so if you look at all the hydromorphological pressures on rivers we see that in 24 percent of cases the problem is the the the, uh, the presence of dams and locks and weirs and um, uh, in rivers uh, either having a, a function still today or 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 being obsolete so there is a if one would be able to address that problem of river continuity, um, it would be a major step in the, in the right direction. What we did um, in terms of the legislative framework the last couple of years is that we evaluated it. Um, so in 2019, at the, at the end of 2019, we concluded that evaluation, uh, much to the relief to, of a um, uh, part of the, um, the community that we work with, we have decided that uh, the, we are not going to make any change to the legislative framework uh, for the moment. Um, we concluded that the, the legislation was by and large um, fit for purpose, even though there was room for improvement in, in a number of areas. Uh, in particular, when it comes to the implementation slash uh, enforcement, uh, the reporting and monitoring, um, overcoming the investment gap, and, and certainly also integration into other policy areas. And to avoid that we end up in a situation or in a, that I give the impression that it's all doom and gloom, um, I really don't think that it is because um, in fact, I think we have at the moment a very good momentum for, for rivers or for addressing river problems um, and perhaps for, for surface water in general. Um, the Commission came with the, the, the European Green Deal. Uh, the, the European Green, De Green Deal gave rise to a number of um, additional initiatives uh, such as the biodiversity strategy, farm to fork, um, and, and a number of others that, that I, in one way or the other are relevant to, to what we are talking about today. Um, and so I think if you, if you take all of that, and, and for me that boils down to a huge pressure on better integrating water concerns into other policy areas on the one hand, and um, uh, generating um, resources that are needed or at least parts of the resources that are needed to, to for investment in this area and you add to that the strong legislative framework that we have with the, the, the timelines that will begin to, to bite uh, very soon. Um, I think that really generates a lot of positive momentum for, um, for looking at, at these issues um, and I should also say that that's over the last couple of years, we've had, of course, a lot of NGO activity uh, in this area, which has made um, this, this issue much more prominent in the eyes of, of policymakers um, and, and the public at large. So uh, it's probably also the, the occasion to say thank you to, to that community. And I know that that community is in part represented here um, at our event. Um, but I think that that certainly helped to, to bring this issue um, much more into the limelight, into the place that it deserves to be. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Hans. Uh, that's a really nice uh, quick overview of the situation in the EU regarding legislation. And, and it's very nice to hear a positive perspective on, on where we're going. I think you've also picked out a, a few interesting issues that I, I hope and expect will come back further in the discussions regarding policy integration and resourcing and so forth. I think these are key issues we should be discussing today. Um, and because everyone's been so respectful of time, we're exactly right for the next uh, session. Um, just check with Henrik. I don't see that at this stage people are ready to start posting comments or questions. Henrik, do we have anything? Uh, no, we don't have any questions yet, so we are, we're good to move ahead. So just a reminder, please feel free to uh, post any questions you have in the chat, and I can uh, bring these to our discussions. So if you have anything, just uh, type away. So thank you, Chris, and uh, we're ready to move on. Great stuff. Okay, then we'll move on to the next uh, segment of the program today, which is free-flowing lifelines for all river conservation. We have a pair of presentations there from the two hosting organizations. Um, 
The first one is to be presented by Aif Silva, representing Wetlands International Europe. Um, Aif, I can give you the floor, I think. And she's, I'm looking over there because she's in the same room, so. <laughs> Hi, good morning everyone and uh, nice to see everyone here and thank you Chris for the introduction. Um, let me start the sharing of my slides. Um, thank you Hans, you've, you've uh, also already gave a bit of an introduction to, to my presentation. Um, and I wanted to, to follow up on that on what are actually the main pressures on our freshwater ecosystems. Um, I hope that my presentation will be starting. Let me try again to start the slideshow. Okay, it seems, yeah, there it is. I'll move to the next or to the first slide right away. Uh, so when I was thinking of how to present um, uh, the pressures and the status of our rivers in Europe and to do this in, in a few minutes time I was I was getting myself in a little bit into trouble because diving into this topic you realize that that um, uh, the situation for our rivers is is quite uh, 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 worrying and the, the pressures are really um, so enormous that that how to even give a, a slight picture of, of what's going on in, in Europe uh, at the moment, uh, not in the least also because um, Europe is a very uh, diverse uh, continent and we have uh, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, types of, of, of rivers um, and the pressures are maybe uh, somewhat similar, but also at the same time, uh, they can vary from, from region to region. So um, my presentation is not going to be comprehensive or I'm not going to be able to even sketch the full picture, but I, I want to, to just um, show you a little bit of, of, of what, what we do know. Uh, and Hans has also mentioned a little bit uh, about the current uh, uh, status that, uh, that our rivers are. If you look at the, the assessment of the European Environment Agency, then um, two years ago, they found that Currently, about 40% of, of our surface waters are in good ecological status, and only, uh, well, 38% is in good chemical status. And surface waters is more than just rivers, but looking, um, uh, comparing rivers to, uh, for example, lakes and coastal waters, we can see that, that they are generally doing worse than, uh, than those other types of water bodies. Um, and what we can see uh, as well um, is how that is reflected for uh, the freshwater biodiversity. And to, to illustrate that, we often look at, at uh, migratory uh, fish and um, fish fauna that, that uh, uh, live in freshwater ecosystems. Uh, and most recently, the World Fish Migration Foundation and other organizations have released the Living Planet Index for Migratory Fish and they showed that on average in Europe, there are declines of 90, 93% uh, for, for migratory freshwater fish, which is highly alarming uh, and should definitely um, be addressed uh, uh, urgently. Um, it's it's not, not only rivers that are doing bad but if we if we look at wetlands um, in general um, they they uh, are doing very uh, they're doing quite bad to compare to uh, for example uh, forests and we have lost about two-thirds of them since the 1900s and um, this is also a figure for Europe because globally they've also uh, we've lost uh, wetlands yeah I think also around 70 percent of the wetlands uh, usually due to drainage. Um, moving on to another staggering number is that uh, in, in Europe, the 95% of the original floodplain area has been converted to other use. Uh, for example, uh, uh, agricultural use or for urban development. Um, so that floodplains have been cut off rivers uh, and have been changed, um, uh, not being able to deliver the 
um, services that they could deliver for society and nature. Uh, and finally, for as for general figures about the status of, of rivers and wetlands is that um, the European Commission also found that 85% of the habitats related to wetlands have an unfavorable conservation status at the moment. So these are, are big numbers and should be really, um, uh, should really illustrate um, to some extent what uh, our freshwater ecosystems and our rivers are, uh, are facing uh, at the moment. I'm going to move a little bit into the pressures that, that rivers are facing. And again, I'm, I cannot be comprehensive due to the limited time of this presentation. But uh, if we look at pollution, uh, we can see that, that uh, the introduction of, of pollutants into our fresh water uh, is, is mainly driven by uh, agriculture, industry, and household. Uh, and those include the excessive nutrient pollution from agriculture. Um, but also chemical pollution from, deposited from the air and uh, also the emissions of heavy metals from industry. Uh, in, you can see the, this uh, uh, graph or picture uh, developed by the European Environment Agency that really shows an overall picture of where our uh, uh, pollution comes from that uh, deteriorates the water quality of, of rivers and uh, and fresh water resources in general. Um, there are some emerging sources that are causing concern, including uh, 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 pollution from pharmaceuticals and microplastics. And those have an effect on, on uh, living organisms, uh, sometimes directly through their toxicity. Uh, they can threaten public health. Um, they can accumulate in the food chain uh, and cause habitat degradation. So it's it's concerning that that only 33, 38% uh, of, of um, surface waters are in good chemical status. And looking at this uh, overall picture, um, uh, we do note that that there has been some improvements in water quality, but that there is uh, certainly potential for for more improvement. Let's say. Um, Hans also uh, touched upon uh, the role of hydromorphological changes to rivers. Um, um, so rivers are uh, largely alter altered uh, physically, um, again, uh, mainly due to uh, the construction of uh, infrastructure like barriers for flood protection, hydropower, uh, transport and irrigation but also uh, as a result of uh, dredging of uh, sediment and uh, straightening or channelization of rivers. Um, and, and the effects for, for freshwater biodiversity are, are, are great because um, changing the morphology and the river flow uh, causes a loss and the degradation of habitats, uh, especially for fish, but certainly also for other uh, 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 other species, freshwater species. Um, Often overlooked is also the loss of floodplains in this respect and the role that floodplains can play uh, when they are still in, in a healthy status and connected to the main channel of the river um, because they also form a habitat for, for several species. Um, so this is uh, again um, concerning. Uh, as Hans was pointing out, the hydromorphological uh, uh, pressures are, are uh, identified as the largest pressure on uh, river status in Europe. Uh, I haven't, um, as I don't have the time to go into all the pressures, uh, I just wanted to point out that, that uh, we don't forget the impact of climate change, uh, as also Per was, uh, was reminding us, uh, or the impact of uh, introducing invasive uh, alien species into our um, eco uh, freshwater ecosystems. Uh, but I just wanted to mention them uh, so that we uh, know that there are more pressures than what I've just shown so far. Uh, so this, this event is really to look at the protection and restoration of uh, rivers. And we have uh, 
uh, both a protection need and a restoration need that I wanted to highlight here. As in, our, in Europe, a lot of uh, rivers are, are altered, but we still have some very natural and, uh, uh, rivers or rivers that are in a nearly pristine status. And those small percentages, they need to, um, they deserve and they need a higher degree of protection. Um, this event, as uh, Chris uh, pointed out in the, at the start, will zoom into uh, the Balkan region as well. So you will be hearing more about this later on. Um, but uh, in general, to point out that there are in the Balkan and in the Mediterranean, uh, there are some uh, very natural rivers, um, but the threat of hydropower expansion there is, um, is large. Um, a recently uh, published overview um, of, uh, of extinction risk uh, due to hydropower for several freshwater fishes uh, showed that these, um, uh, the existing, but the new and the newly planned hydropower plants could cause uh, up to 186 fish species uh, uh, to be driven towards extinction. And um, not always uh, known is that it's ma mainly the small hydropower plants with a installed capacity of less than 10 megawatts, which caused the biggest problem uh, in this respect. Um, later, uh, there will be more presentation going much more in depth into this uh, issue. Um, so I'm going to quickly uh, highlight uh, what would be, according to us, the most necessary restoration needs for rivers. And uh, indeed, uh, uh, of the 1.2 million uh, uh, kilometers of rivers in uh, Europe, um, uh, most of them are highly fragmented. And the, uh, the Amber project uh, has estimated that about 1 million barriers exist in, uh, in European rivers. And this is only an estimation because the, the actual magnitude is largely unknown and the data is not, um, is not complete. So maybe uh, we have even more, a higher degree of fragmentation than what we know so far. Again, it's not the, the big guys that are causing the biggest problem, but it's the 85% of all the small uh, of all barriers that are very small, um, lower than one to two, one to two meters, uh, and that really cause a high degree of fragmentation. So obviously there is a big need to restore uh, the connectivity um, to be able to uh, restore also the natural processes that rivers can. Uh, uh, to restore the natural processes of rivers and the services that they can uh, provide us with. Uh, so this would include, of course, the uh, removal of dam, weirs, uh, etc. But definitely not to forget reconnecting floodplains and uh, restoring wetlands. Uh, my final slide, uh, quickly to highlight the role of the EU Water Framework Directives, uh, EU Water Framework Directive in this. Um, so. Uh, indeed, we need to achieve the good status of both for ecology, chemistry, but also for the quantity uh, of waters. And this needs to be achieved through the protection, restoration, uh, reduction of pollution and sustainable water management. And uh, during the health check or the fitness check of the Water Framework Directive, we have uh, analyzed uh, what uh, the role of the Water Framework Directive has been in the past uh, uh, decade and a half and we saw that in some countries it has uh, resulted in national legislation on water management where there wasn't so far. We've also seen that there have been water quality improvements even though as we pointed out it can be much more and we've seen that uh, more stringent environmental impact assessments for new developments in rivers for example or other water bodies uh, have have been the result of the Water Framework Directive being uh, established. Also, it has uh, um, opened up uh, the water domain uh, for participation of more stakeholders than traditionally were there. Uh, and, uh, uh, and more stakeholders can actually uh, uh, participate in the river basin management planning uh, 
to be able to make sure that social and environmental uh, interests are also met when planning uh, uh, in planning the water management. Uh, the Water Frame Directive has also uh, spurred international river basin cooperation. Um, and there are some good examples across Europe for, of uh, 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 river basin committees where countries are uh, cooperating uh, to address um, the pressures that we mentioned uh, and implement measures um, at a basin scale. Nevertheless, um, we see there is an ongoing deterioration of rivers and uh, that deterioration is outpacing the current restoration efforts. Uh, so, the, like Hans said, uh, the momentum is, uh, is, is now to see how we can turn this around and actually make sure that restoration efforts in uh, the coming decade will outpace the deterioration. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Aif. Uh, so you've brought us down a level of detail in a little bit, despite the time constraints, you've managed to give a picture of some of the priority areas of concern. I think uh, looking forward, you, you've highlighted, for instance, the small scale fragmentation of the rivers as a whole as being a huge issue. Um, this, and associated with that, the uh, issues facing migratory fish looking forward, as well as some of the perhaps better known uh, information upon uh, water quality and so we still have really quite some challenges going forward, despite the good progress, which uh, Hans has already highlighted. I'd like to move to our next presenter, with all haste. That's going to be Henrik Osterblad, who is uh, speaking on behalf of the Nature Conservancy, where he is their freshwater conservation coordinator. There he helps coordinate uh, his organization's river restoration initiatives in Europe, uh, while also focusing on EU and global biodiversity and freshwater policy questions. Uh, with a background in physical geography and aquatic sciences, he's also worked in different sectors in the past, including marine scientific research. Um, Henrik, I'd like to give you the floor. You're going to tell us about why we should protect and restore rivers. Thank you very much, Chris, for the introduction. Yes, certainly. Let me just share my presentation first of all, and we can get started. Let's see, I hope we can all see it. Can you all see the um, slideshow? I think it should be full screen now. Uh, brilliant. Yeah, well, thanks very much for everyone for attending. It's, it's great to have you all here. Um, in terms of rivers in themselves, we have had a great overview from EIF, uh, what problems we face, and sincerely, there are quite a few problems we need, need seeing into. But as Hans Schielstra from the Commission also puts it, it's not all doom and gloom. We do know what the solutions are, and there's certainly more awareness on the issue of uh, river fragmentation and other issues in the freshwater. Uh, environment, so uh, things seem to be moving forward. Now, why restore and protect rivers and why now? Uh, as a segue from what I just said is really related to the current developments, first of all in EU policy and also uh, global policy as well as uh, current restoration projects which have demonstrated considerable um, process, pro um, progress in actually uh, reversing biodiversity decline in certain areas. So without further ado, I'm going to go into my presentation. So as Eve mentioned, we have seen extreme freshwater biodiversity decline, which is really why we should act now. Uh, we need to reverse this trend before we reach a point where uh, restoring freshwater biodiversity will become increasingly difficult or nigh impossible in certain areas, especially in places where we have pristine um, biodiversity cases uh, or systems which are potentially in danger of disappearing entirely. And as I said, there's the political and legislative momentum. Um, the main focus, however, should be that river ecosystems have not been in the spotlight compared to others in the past. The focus has been on terrestrial and marine conservation, especially in terms of protected areas and, and, and uh, coverage. So really now is the time to focus on uh, river ecosystems uh, and giving them their limelight as well. So just briefly recapping, I mean, there's the reason uh, for restoring rivers, which is this urgent need for biodiversity recovery. As you can see from this graph, taken from the Living Planet Index, uh, biodiversity uh, in freshwaters has declined the most of all 
uh, ecosystems across the planet in, uh, and observed 1,406 populations of migratory fish, um, 247 species. We've seen around 76% of these decline in abundance from the 1970s. And as mentioned, the main reasons for this is habitat loss and degradation. Uh, so to speak, fragmentation and alteration of our habitats in the form of barriers or augmentation of uh, rivers' hydromorpho hydrogeomorphological properties. Um, and as mentioned, the key issue here is really the in-stream barriers uh, that cause this poor conservation status for these very important um, fish species in our ecosystems. Now, uh, in terms of enabling conditions for this type of work, uh, for river restoration and conservation initiatives, there's certainly developing momentum both globally and regionally for increased measures in this area. Uh, in the EU, as we mentioned before, as other speakers have mentioned before, we have the Water Framework Directive and the Nature Directives, which all aim to achieve essentially good ecological status for our systems uh, within the next seven, 10 years and beyond. There are certain deadlines in place here. The key thing to remember here is that as much as these uh, directives are great in their own right, uh, and the issue is that implementation seems to be lagging behind in certain aspects. Of course, there are things that can be used to, done to support these. Um, and this is what restoration really aims to do. So we've only seen um, only a few ish initiatives in the past um, for specific protection designations of rivers in both EU and non-EU member states, uh, both outside and inside the, the frame of the water, uh, the frame of EU water legislation. Uh, but as stated, these are fairly limited, limited currently to five countries, uh, from what we are aware, and uh, really should be a topic for discussion. Uh, come the future of uh, discussions of freshwater biodiversity decline. Uh, and as mentioned as well, there are several restoration initiatives underway uh, at both national governmental and non-governmental level. Uh, TNC has several underway in, in uh, Europe as well, in the Southeast Europe region. Uh, but of course, there's the issue of these being fairly limited in their location and scope. So really there's a need for a system scale approach and a more dedicated um, efforts to Europe wide to address all river ecosystems since these are certainly uh, more than just single rivers they are a connected network and really to um, restore biodiversity by the rates we need to restore we need to uh, really approach this from a holistic uh, point of view now as mentioned there is really uh, a future political and legislative momentum happening now so the conversation is really going on uh, first of all, we have a UN decade of restoration. So the next 10 years um, set by the global political stage uh, really recognizes the issue of restoration and protection of ecosystems as a really pressing issue. Pressing issue. Uh, really calling for all actors and governments to step up their uh, game, so to speak, and uh, address the issue to solve, solve problems we're seeing. So thanks to this acknowledgement that we're seeing this degradation and pollution and biodiversity decline. Thanks to the observations from, from water policy, especially EU policy, and researchers globally, um, we have uh, now a firm understanding that we really need some action on the on this point. Um, yes, uh, recognize. And of course, um, with restoration measures, one of the main aims is to boost the implementation of said EU uh, nature and water legislation. So for to achieve the Water Framework Directive's 2027 objectives, mm -hmm. uh, mainly supporting member states in, in doing so, these restoration measures uh, are really result-driven and, and strongly supportive actions, which uh, I'll dive into in minutes to show you exactly how effective they can be. So just as an example, I think we could find uh, we have ob obstacle removal in uh, the US, which has been a very strong feature of uh, the American chapter of TNC uh, throughout the years. So this is mainly uh, measures refer referring to obstacle and barrier removal, both culverts and barriers in stream, so road crossings, etc. as well, uh, and uh, rebuilding. Uh, effectively, from 1820s to uh, 2012, only 4% of historical habitat was accessible for migratory fish species in this basin uh, before barrier removal activities started as you can see from this um, see from this map fairly small amount of the channel was accessible and then once that once uh, dam removal and barrier removal actually started happening we uh, managed to free up the main channel 
uh, and like 62% of the habitats accessible effectively reconnecting 2,600 kilometers of river for these migratory species. Now, the, um, just to illustrate why we really should be going into these kind of uh, whole scale restoration measures, the effect can be really, really astounding and happen really, really quickly. So within a matter of hours, and uh, we effectively see fish returning to these rivers, and in the long term, populations can really, really soar. So just to draw your attention to the graph on the right side, We've seen an exponential rise in the river herring population all the way from uh, 2013, just after the dam removals, going up to uh, very recent times, 2019, where we see 2.8 to 6 million individuals uh, cross certain points uh, in the river. So really, really exponential returns. And obviously the native fish has, not only the migratory fish have benefited from this, but also the native fish. Um, and uh, not only that, but also the migratory and local bird life, which are depending on these, these, um, these fish for food. And also it doesn't only stay in freshwater, it affects the marine as well. Uh, naturally, as these species are migratory, uh, in terms of prey species in the marine areas, we've seen increased presence of marine fish species at mouths to rivers as well. Not to mention uh, what may be happening in the oceans, thanks to more of, for example, these salmon and river herrings returning to, uh, to the ocean. After spawning. Uh, the economic response has also been very, very strong. So there's more resource availability and larger uh, fish stocks, which allows for more fishing quotas, uh, which effectively um, makes uh, returns for certain uh, industry reliant on um, freshwater habitats and fish for their economic activity and, uh, and, and business. Uh, effectively, we've seen uh, revenue quadruple over a period of 10 years in this basin. So there's a really, really strong economic return thanks to the return of these fish. Uh, for example, the lobster industry uh, has more cheaper and readily available baits, which in turn leads to a greater financial return for, um, uh, for, for the companies as well. And of course, uh, one very positive aspect was with the 2010 Haiti disaster. Uh, after the disaster, we managed to export um, uh, a lot of catch thanks to the more increased um, fish we had in the system to be able to relieve um, uh, relieve that site. I think I might breeze over this because we might be short on time. Uh, but also just very, very importantly is the social response. So uh, historically the Penobscot Indian nation had historic rights to fish in the river. These were not respected. Um, Unfortunately, and for the first time after the river was made accessible, there was a re, um, retrial to see if they could um, consolidate these rights and it actually went through. And now the Indian nation has uh, access to all the historical um, sites within the, the, the basin, thanks to these barrier removals that practically allowing for access and, and uh, fishing grounds as well. And actually we've seen the increase in, in recreation and the revenue from tourism um, and also fishing licenses, which have been granted for, uh, for fishing now at an increased rate since there's, first of all, fish ready available and people are aware that there are fish there and want to go and fish, um, et cetera. And the most strong thing we, uh, the, fact we, the factor we saw from uh, the dam removal process was the, inc was the increased local and public interest uh, to interact with the river. Frankly, with these products, with the visibility, they really piqued people's interests and uh, reconnected a lot of people to their natural environments, and uh, especially in terms of education and involvement and uh, the history of a river and uh, national fish species as well. It's really been a strong resport, uh, response. And also, just from a health perspective, we've been looking at smaller carbon footprint footprint due to, due to less imported fish and also uh, really a fresh supply of fish for the local population and now relying more and more on their local river rather than uh, buying food and fish from the uh, outside, especially for the very local towns in the region. So just to give you an overview of um, what's going on. So we have before where we have a small river channel and then after where we freed up the main channel and now the product's really focusing on freeing up these very very productive headwaters where we have uh, quite a lot of fish wanted to access to sort of boost the, the remaining aspect of um, uh, or find more or less finalize the restoration aspect of this project which is you know making the whole system accessible to the species that need it. So what do we really need to see uh, in terms of a house. So 
Restoration is a proven concept. It does really work in terms of uh, quick response um, and uh, how it restores um, freshwater biodiversity and mitigates decline. Now, really where we need to go is we need to also consider these freshwater bodies as integral parts of a strict protection and protection targets uh, by 2030, which is being highlighted by the both global and EU uh, legislative um, or legislations and strategies right currently uh, in process. Uh, we also need to ensure that these restoration efforts are durable in the long term. So once we restore these rivers, we shouldn't uh, defer, well, fragment them again for the sake of protecting them in the long term and the biodiversity that we're now currently hosting. Uh, so we should make sure that our, our rivers are protected for perpetuity uh, to ensure that biodiversity is so as well for the future, especially with, with climate change uh, being a factor, we need to make sure that our biodiversity has the opportunity to be resilient. Uh, and this is one of the measures which can be applied to make sure that this is the case. And really integrates a freshwater protection and restoration at this basin scale, scale approach, as mentioned, uh, Europe-wide and also globally, to make sure that we have really this focus on connectivity overall, um, to make sure that we have the best optimum outcome of our restoration protection efforts. Uh, we also have uh, the very important point, which is, I see the number is a bit off here, but uh, ensuring a harmonization between EU policies, especially in EU, things like energy, transport, climate, and so forth. It's a very delicate balance, especially in, in certain member states, which are who are looking to uh, develop these infrastructures um, and also protect biodiversity. Um, so I, it's a very, very um, important process. And obviously, we have to ensure adequate financing. You know, these things do cost um, to put into to put into practice as measures, uh, but also developing a prioritization system where we can effectively look at the, um, uh, the best way forward in which systems to protect in terms of biodiversity importance and also systems in themselves and so forth. I think I'm out of time. Uh, I'm a tiny bit over, so I'm going to stop there, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. I hope this gives you a really quick overview of what restoration projects can do, uh, both socially, naturally, and economically, uh, but also what's needed in the future and how this should be uh, should be approached and I hope this uh, caters for more discussion um, later on in the session. So uh, thank you. That's all for me. So if you have any questions as stated, I will happily take them. Thanks, uh, Henrik. Uh, indeed, we, we are a couple of minutes over, which is not so bad, I think, given we have the coffee break now. Um, thanks for giving us a nice overview, reminding us and, and illustrating so why it's so important to protect and restore rivers and associated wetland ecosystems with some quite convincing cases uh, that also links into the wider socioeconomic development in the EU, Green Deal issues and so forth. So I think it's a great, it's a great screen setter and it points the finger at some key issues we need to take going forward, which I expect we'll go into a bit deeper in the coming sessions, but we start to look at the legal framework and we have uh, a panel discussion with some member state representatives to illustrate what they've been doing. So I hope we can pick up some of the points you're mentioning there in those discussions. I'll, I'll do my best to help with that. Um, in terms of uh, questions and feedback, we have one from Tom Bowser uh, on Water Framework Directive and Good Ecological Potential. Um, I'm not sure, Henrik, maybe you would want to respond to that or what we could also propose to do is we try to build that into the next session, which looks more at the legal framework and how that's being implemented. I think that may be a wise choice. We are just running into the coffee break and it seems to be a question related to that as well on good ecological potential. So certainly a question we can bring up during that session. So if okay, so to do that, then... Tom, please stay with us and we'll try and get your point addressed in the next uh, presentations. <laughs> Thumbs up from Tom. And uh, if you would all like to take a break, it can be coffee or whatever takes your fancy and we will uh, be back uh, active at quarter to, to uh, sorry, yeah, quarter to 12, yeah. Thank you.
Should I start? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to start uh, on time after the coffee break, as per the agenda. Um, hope you've all had a nice drink or bite of something to eat. Um, we're going to move on now to the next uh, block of the agenda, which is looking more at the legal frameworks. Okay, that's strange. I'm not muted. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Please yes, Chris, yeah. yeah. Yeah, seem to be an issue. Oh, my, my apologies. Yeah, please. <laughs> please uh, it's good. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, I was just, uh, for Henrik's benefit, saying, I hope you had a nice drink and a bite to eat. We're going to move to the next block of the agenda now, which is starting to look at the legal frameworks in a bit more detail. And um, the second half of this segment will go on to a panel discussion with some member state representatives. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Uh, this session now is going to be a double act between um, Hans Stielstra and Eif Silver, from whom you've already heard. Um, I was remiss earlier. I've introduced everyone diligently up front except for Eif, although she's known to many of you I know, but uh, just to give a quick introduction, Eif is uh, Wetlands International's Policy Officer on Water and Rivers in the European Office. Uh, she focuses particularly on river protection and restoration with a master's degree in environment and resource management. And pre previous to working for Wetlands International, she's also uh, worked in the water management and water policy sector in the Netherlands. Now, Eif, is it going to be yourself kicking off or Hans? Okay, we're going to start with Hans, who you've already heard from. And uh, Hans, I'd like to give the, the floor to you to start to talk a little bit about the legal basis and rationale for supporting river restoration and protection. Are you ready, Hans? Okay, Hans is uh, maybe not quite ready. Aha, uh -huh. he's coming, I think. Here I am. Good. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, yeah, look, I was trying to share my, uh, my presentation. Uh, just wondering how to do that. Um, you should be able to click the share screen button yeah. uh, under the screen and then you have to scroll down and sometimes you might have more windows open than it will show and then in the bottom right hand corner there's a little blue line that says show all windows and then it shows you everything or alternatively Ape's telling me if, if you prefer she can uh, present your PowerPoint and you can prompt her to change slides. I uh, think that that will be safer. Okay just give us a moment. Are you okay Ape? Here it comes. You recognize your presentation, I hope? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I okay. do, I do. Okay, thank you very I'll much. I'll leave you and Eif to, to move this forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eif, for, uh, for showing your presentation. I, I, I think I overestimated my, uh, my Zoom abilities, um, certainly on, um, on, on, the, on the iPad. Um, for some reason, it's still not really possible for me to show it from the commission system. Um, all right, so my intention really is uh, two things. So to go into a little bit more detail uh, on the legislation and um, what it implies when it comes to, um, to rivers, um, what it asks from, from member states, uh, but also why we're doing it. And I want to look also at uh, what this new biodiversity strategy means for um, for rivers and <clears throat> how it is connected to uh, to the work that we are doing under the water framework directive so if 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 you move to the second slide please uh, i will start with the um what we found in the um in, in the evaluation that i referred to earlier in in the morning in, in a bit more detail so what we did was uh uh, a fairly lengthy evaluation of the legislation as we have it in place and we have this funny um, jargon uh, that calls it a fitness check of, of the legislation uh, but it's basically a, a thorough evaluation of a lot of legislation at the same time so in, in our case we looked at the water framework directive at the groundwater directive at the 
directive that sets the environmental quality standards um, and the floods directive. Now I will only focus on the water framework directive uh, for the purpose of this presentation. And what we found there is that um, um, on the positive side, um, we've managed with this legislation to make sure that there is a, a governance structure set up in the member states um, for integrated water management, which is a, is a considerable achievement and extremely important. I think that, that we have that. And uh, if truth be told, and, and I should also say that it took a fair amount of time before that got set up, before everyone properly understood what to do um, and how to do it. Um, the second is that we found that the deterioration of water status uh, slowed down. Uh, so um, I, I think we achieved or, or collectively um, probably the delinking between, on the one hand, economic activity and on the other hand, the, the, the quality of water. Uh, so uh, the, deter the, the deterioration at least slowed down across the EU. Um, and uh, uh, I think we also achieved a reduction of the pollution of, um, of rivers uh, across the board. But then we also have to be honest and say um, the implementation was quite considerably delayed. I mean, it took a fairly long time before structures were in place, um, our policies were developed, um, money was found, money was invested. Uh, pressures identified, water bodies monitored, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, whereas the original deadline or the, the the deadline for the Water Framework Directive was to have uh, water bodies in good status by 2015, um, this is not the case, um, and um, we're actually falling quite far behind on that. Uh, to give you an illustration of that, uh, around half of Europe's water bodies, so around 55,000 water bodies in Europe are under some form of exemption. Um, so that means that it's, it's perfectly legal to invoke those exemptions um, by member states, but member states are quite massively doing that uh, and, and to such a scale that we fear that uh, it's not realistic to think that all those exemptions are no longer needed by 2027. Anyway. Um, so we haven't reached all of the objectives of, of the Water Framework Directive uh, for three principal reasons. Slow implementation, as I mentioned before, a lack of funding and insufficient integration into sectoral uh, policies. And in particular, um, agriculture is, 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 has already been mentioned before. Uh, it's certainly one big driver of pressure on, on water bodies, but there are others there. There is the energy sector with the, the use of water for fossil fuels, there's transport. Um, but I would say there's also health or, or, or uh, industry. So there's a number of continuing pressures on, on, uh, on, on the quality of water bodies across the EU. On the next uh, slide, uh, the next slide shows you what we intend to do in the follow up of the water framework direct. So a lot of uh, political discussion has been going on about should this uh, piece of legislation be uh, opened up or not. I mean, that, that seemed to become at some stage some sort of theological discussion uh, between those in favor and those uh, against. Well, those uh, against uh, have, have won, <laughs> to put it like that. Um, but what so what, what is going to happen is that we will we will keep uh, the the legislation in place uh, for now. We we are not going to propose any any fundamental change or any change whatsoever. The only thing that we will do is that we will look at um, the lists that we currently have for certain pollutants uh, in surface water and in groundwater, and um, these. These pollutants is not just a list of pollutants. I mean, it means that as soon as that a particular substance is on that list of pollutants, um, that it will be um, that there will be an obligation to phase out or to to reduce or to phase out those uh, those substances. So it's quite important uh, that we update that list and that we 
uh, in the process also look at, at micro pollutants uh, that we have not focused on that much so far, uh, whether they be uh, microplastics or um, uh, or pharmaceuticals or other categories of pollutants that uh, are not currently uh, sufficiently included on those lists and that they be included in the in the future. So if we do uh, decide to come with a proposal for revision of the of, of that aspect of the legislation, it will be in 2022 uh, due to all the, the the work that we need to do in order to prepare such a change. And then it will only it will go into co-decision and it will take maybe until 2024, 2025 before that actually kicks in. Um, so we're not sitting on our hands uh, in, in, in the meantime. Uh, we're doing a lot of other things that um, uh, should accelerate the implementation or, or, or the achievement of the objectives. So step up the implementation is the first point uh, better implementing the existing rules that is not only the water framework directive but also all the other legislation that somehow has a an impact on uh, on water quality uh, maybe the main one to mention here is the urban wastewater treatment directive um, there's huge uh, implementation gaps all around and and i think we, th we think we have to increase the pressure on, on member states to make sure that they actually implement uh, that legislation. So we will do that. We will also uh, see to what extent we can help the um, uh, investment in, in water. We, we know that there is a considerable investment gap. Um, between, between brackets, I, I just want to mention that it's not only a matter of sheer, uh, the, the sheer amount of money that is poured into the water. Um, it's also about uh, having the right, the, the enough administrative capacity to, to deal with that, to actually uh, invest that money, to have the projects in place, to do all the preparatory work. Um, so it's not simply a matter of uh, opening the, uh, the money tap and, and pouring the money down, uh, but it, it's really also a matter of having the right structures in place to be able to, to handle that money and to uh, invest it in the right issues. But we think that with the recovery package, there is uh, more of an opportunity um, um, uh, financially also. Then we want to integrate water objectives better into other EU policies. Um, in, in that sense, super pleased, of course, with uh, what, what has been um, proposed when it comes to agricultural policy. Uh, but we also want uh, to make sure that the transport uh, policy of the future does not go at the expense of, uh, of water quality nor uh, the energy. And of course, around energy, there is a big uh, debate. Uh, we have extremely ambitious um, targets when it comes to, um, to renewable energy, to, um, to avoiding basically fossil fuels uh, as much as possible in the future. But that means that there will be an increased pressure on, on hydropower. And um, if uh, in your presentation already mentioned that um, the, the, the role of hydropower in, um, in the Balkans, but this is very much also the case in, in other parts of Europe. And, um, there's clearly a conflicting interest and we need somehow to, to deal with that. And while I generally agree with the role of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the relative damage that small hydropower can, can generate, we also know that uh, there is a, a huge quest for um, what is called CO2-free uh, kilowatt hours, although I, I know they're not fully uh, CO2-free. But anyway, just to illustrate that we have a pressure there as well. The final point I want to mention under this heading of, of what we do beyond uh, the chemicals is that we will try to simplify um, uh, the monitoring and reporting, um, and not only simplify but also try to um, make it more relevant. So to, to make sure that we have more up-to-date, more relevant, more precise information without uh, unduly increasing the burden on, on member states. The next slide um, shows you, um, if, if you can move to the next slide, thank you very much. Uh, it shows you the, the overall challenge that we, will, that we have, uh, simply to illustrate uh, where um, cumulatively uh, we have the main uh, challenges uh, ahead of us. Uh, 
is the, the part of Europe from which I'm speaking uh, is certainly is certainly part of that. Uh, well, I don't need to go into detail. I think on this one, we know that that agriculture and, and hydromorphological pressures uh, make a define, but determine this to to a large degree. Um, I've just highlighted the the, the forty percent uh, of of uh, for the hydromorphological pressures uh, as the most significant pressures on on the water body. Actually, it is the single biggest uh, category of pressures. Um, the next slide you can skip, um, and, and then I would like to move straight to um, hydromorphology. So what does the Water Framework Directive actually require from, from member states? I mentioned already this first point, already in vogue, uh, in force since 2003, so further deterioration is not uh, allowed in principle, except under very strict conditions uh, when it comes to, to new, uh, new investments. Um, achieving good status, as I mentioned uh, already before, and then uh, when it comes to hydromorphology, um, we, well, what the Water Framework Directive essentially requires is, is, is member states to take a number of measures um, listed all there, uh, removing obstacles is one, installing fish passages, uh, reconnecting backwaters, uh, water retention measures, etc, etc. So there's a number of concrete measures that, that member states um, uh, need to take in order to meet the objectives of the legislation. And if you could now go to not the next slide, but the one after that. Thank you, and we will return to the previous slide after this. I, I want to look a bit at well the most recent policy developments and, and one of the major ones there is the adoption of the biodiversity strategy for 2030. Um, Henrik uh, also already uh, referred to this one uh, in one of his slides. Um, this is, uh, these are, are, are I think the main freshwater related targets in the biodiversity strategy. Um, so there is the, um, the idea to increase the um, surface of land and sea that is under protection and uh, to 30% um, and one third of that should be under strict protection and, and freshwater ecosystems, uh, it's been mentioned before, are one of the most vulnerable ecosystems that we have in Europe and they, they they are included in, in this uh, 30 percent. Then um, restoring freshwater ecosystems and the natural function, so uh, that is the WFD objective mm -hmm. that uh, I mentioned before. Then we have a very specific target on uh, restoring at least 25,000 kilometers of free-flowing rivers. Um, that target has uh, I think received a lot of attention and I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that because um, for me uh, that probably is the main function of this target to draw a lot of attention to uh, the need to increase the number of or the kilometers uh, of free-flowing rivers in Europe. Um, we've seen in the illustrations uh, from, from the US that Henry just presented what amazing effects uh, that can have on, on biodiversity, but also the effects that it has uh, on, well, on the, along the social dimension and the economic dimension. So I think it's extremely important to, to, to have more attention for that. Um, when we were considering this target, we got reactions from, from various parts, wondering whether the next step would be for the EU to remove uh, sluices and flood barriers and, and, and those sorts of things. Of course, that is not the idea. Um, what we are primarily targeting here are the obsolete barriers that we find all over Europe. I, I cannot give you the exact figure, uh, but we've seen from AIF uh, that uh, the number, the overall number of barriers is around a million, uh, so one for, for every uh, kilometer of, of a river. Um, so uh, the, the potential of, of, for removing obsolete barriers is, is truly enormous. Um, we also have a target on the restoration or well restoring and preserving ecological flows uh, where member states are asked to review their water abstraction and impoundment permits 
And then, of course, uh, we have announced that we would come with a, a proposal for legislation, binding legislation on restoration targets, and already by 2021. And I can I can assure you that this is super ambitious to um, to 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 get there. Um, and there is at the moment a consideration of what possible targets we could we could uh, propose and whether there is a need to do anything in addition to the water framework directive i very quickly go back to the previous slide and i've seen the message that i should uh, I should uh, stop soon uh, what will we do on those uh, on those 25000 uh, kilometers uh, the important word kilometers is missing from this uh, from the title um well we are at the moment we have started to work to come um in in, in the context of the water framework directive um, community to generate a, a guidance document by next year which should be looking at issues that i have here on the slide so uh, on issues of mapping and prioritization uh on definitions um, also on, on accessing um, finance uh, for this, uh, on, on best practice throughout the member states, etc., etc. So we want to use a guidance document that we want, that we hope to adopt next year, to to bring together all the the relevant knowledge and the metrics and the priorities and everything that one needs to 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 have in order to operationalize this um, this this particular target. Okay, I, I, in view of the time, I will stop here. Um, I'm very happy to discuss uh, further in uh, as, as part of the, the Q&A. Potential. Thanks very much, Hans. Sorry to have to hurry you along a little bit. Um, but we have a second presentation in, in this segment, which is coming from AIF again, um, from the perspective uh, more from NGOs, that's international, I believe. So AIF, I, I want to quickly give you the floor uh that's okay one second let me just take my sound off um otherwise you'll get this terrible feedback there you go let me open my presentation so i have um only a few slides in which i uh, i wanted to build on what what uh, hans was uh, presenting uh, just now be, uh, before me uh diving a little bit into the river restoration um question and and the implementation gap of the water framework directive and uh related to river restoration and how that could relate to the new uh, legislation coming up uh, as a result of the biodiversity strategy. Uh, I wanted to start uh, quickly with uh, how we see or what we see, uh, how we define river restoration. And I'll, I'll read it. Um, we see river restoration as it refers to ecological, physical, spatial, and management measures and practices aimed at restoring a more natural state and functioning of the river system in support of biodiversity and of several key ecosystem services, including flood and drought risk mitigation, aquifer recharge, nutri nutrient retention and recreation. And river restoration is an integral part of sustainable water management and directly supports the aims of the Water Framework Directive, as well as national and regional water management policies. And I wanted to, to uh, point out uh, this definition so that we can see what the the actually the scope is of river restoration um, as it goes beyond just for example removing uh, a transversal barrier within a stream um, it encompasses uh, a lot more um, when looking at the implementation of the water framework directive and the river restoration efforts um, so far we can see that that there remains uh, obviously a gap between the current and the uh, status that we need to achieve and that has been due to the imbalance uh, uh, that that occurred between the scale of the pressures that the society has put on rivers um, and the scale of the restoration efforts that that have been uh, implemented so far um, in in uh, in light of the eu water framework directive uh, fitness check we have been analyzing uh, how the water framework directive has uh, has uh, spurred uh, river restoration 
uh, efforts and we saw that most of the uh, so that that they they do um, uh, improve the water body status but mostly at a very uh, local level um, so what we see is that more actions are needed to improve those conditions at the water body scale and uh, and to to illustrate that for example a lot of river restoration measures for example they focus on maybe half a kilometer or a few kilometers of a river stretch whereas a water body might be up to 30 or 40 kilometers in length um, so even after such an intervention you would not see uh, a change in the entire water body status uh, given the the, the local uh, scale of the of the restoration measure um, so what is needed is first of all to upscale the, the interventions of river restoration and second, of course, to be able to do that, we also need to have the funding. Uh, and as Hans pointed out, there has been a lack of, uh, of funding um, or investment in, in, uh, in measures uh, in the first two cycles of the river basin, uh, of the river basin management planning. Um, so it would be, absolutely necessary to to increase the investment in the next cycle um, and talking about scale uh, uh, as i will point out next in in a in a case study is that uh, we the basin approach would also need more attention to to be able to uh, achieve that good ecological status because uh, you can um, uh, restore a local site, but if the pressures in the upstream catchment remain, then it might not, uh, then it might impact uh, or it might mean that you fail to achieve your uh, good ecological status at the, uh, at the site where you've just um, implemented a restoration measure. Um, so I, one of the case studies that, that uh, Wetlands International and the Italian Center for River Restoration have found um, uh, where the uh, Water Framework Directive has been implemented is in the, is the UK, the River Clayton. It's a small scale restoration project where uh, several uh, pressures have, uh, have occurred due to, um, uh, uh, for industrial purposes, the, the river has been canalized. There has been floodplain disconnection, uh, damming and drainage. Um, and so the, the, the authority implemented some measures to achieve a better ecological conditions, uh, taking uh, uh, a range of measures at a small stretch of the river, including floodplain reconnection and the removal of the embankment and restoration of the channel morphology. And uh, what we saw is that, uh, uh, that there has been uh, an impact and ecological conditions have improved, for example, the connectivity of the habitat and the heterogeneity of the habitats uh, have improved. Um, there has been monitoring of the uh, of the fauna and to see what what effects it had, and there were uh, uh, and there were local effects um, for uh, for the bioindicators, except that uh, the monitoring system uh, didn't show any improvement in the in the channel itself of the stretch, but when they looked at the uh, at the backwaters, which had been reconnected uh, uh, thanks to this um, restoration project, they saw that there the bioindicators did uh, improve. However, uh, uh, these um, these connected uh, systems, these connected floodplains, uh, backwaters, or wetlands are not necessarily always part of the water framework directive uh, monitoring or uh, are not, for example, designated water body uh, under the Water Framework Directive. So sometimes you might miss the effect on biodiversity uh, due to, uh, for example, the sensitivity of the monitoring system or due to the focus of the, uh, of the water body uh, as, uh, as under the Water Framework Directive. Um, so what I'd like to point out is that um, the rest that restoration project uh, should focus not just on the stream itself, but also on the adjacent uh, wetlands uh, um, and habitats, which could be 
particularly important for uh, biodiversity restoration. And another thing that was uh, uh, that 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 was shown uh, in this um, case study is that uh, the even though there was an improvement of the conditions at the site itself, uh, in the upper stretches of the, of the catchment, there were still stresses from, uh, from, the agricultural, uh, uh, from the agricultural land use, which had an impact on the downstream biological communities. So we need to, to look at the, you know, the skill of the, of the restoration project doesn't only uh, um, doesn't stay within the site, you need to also have a look at what's happening more upstream uh, and to have to take into account the, the, uh, uh, the impact or the positive results for uh, your restored uh, river. So in sum, the, the size of the, of the restoration uh, should really be proportional to the system uh, in its uh, entirety. And um, bridging that to, to Hans's question about uh, how um, the biodiversity strategy could really support uh, the achievement of the Water Framework Directive objectives and, uh, and vice versa, because the Water Framework Directive also, the measures taken uh, also help achieve the biodiversity strategy goals. Um, First of all, uh, um, we need to look at, uh, uh, first of all, we need to, to go, um, we need to start at the uh, existing legislation, but also go beyond. So there are a certain elements to consider um, in the upcoming discussions, in the upcoming months, uh, when we talk about the, uh, uh, the initiatives under the biodiversity strategy and possibly the, the legally binding restoration targets. Uh, uh, so as the case study illustrated, first of all, to, um, uh, uh, we could think about targets for not just the water body or the, the, the channel itself, but also see how we can uh, propose binding targets for um, for the restoration of wetlands with our, which are important to achieve the biodiversity goals in the water bodies themselves. Um, and to upscale the, uh, the restoration measures. Um, but maybe it's not just a need of, of going bigger and looking bigger, looking bigger because there are also small size uh, water bodies that are currently uh, overlooked by the Water Framework Directive, but which are very significant for uh, biodiversity, including, for example, ponds. So this could be a consideration of, of including in the, in the nature restoration plan that the commission has, uh, uh, has proposed under the biodiversity strategy. Um, as the case study tried to show, to show is also the importance of connecting, um, uh, connecting uh, at the landscape level um, uh, to, to restore not just you know at the site but also uh, connected to what's happening elsewhere in the in the river system uh, so in order to to improve the ecological functioning uh, and also retain it um, Hans mentioned the the target for the free flowing rivers and we could think of uh, re binding targets uh, um, for for free flowing rivers uh, in uh, in this nature restoration plan or the the possible new law that that could be uh, could be proposed and uh, some more ideas um, is to and this will be also uh, discussed a bit later on in the presentations is that uh, how if you restore your uh, your river and your stream uh, functions and habitats, how can you keep those restored and at this higher status than what they were in before? And there will be some ideas for this uh, presented uh, in next presentations. Um, obviously, the funding of measures have been uh, um, have been discussed 
have been mentioned a couple of times. Uh, the Water Fairing Directive offers its own, um, uh, has the, its own uh, principles for this, uh, but under the biodiversity strategy, we could um, uh, or we should consider ring funds ring fenced funds for, for the implementation of measures um, related to river restoration and restoration of freshwater biodiversity. Uh, finally, the role of nature-based solutions should have a, a closer look. At the moment, only 1% of uh, all the investment in water resource management is going to uh, nature-based solutions. So there is a big potential there uh, and the potential to for these solutions to help achieve the uh, biodiversity restoration targets. Well, obviously uh, discussions are, are ongoing. So, so these rough ideas, uh, uh, yeah, I would like to, to invite uh, uh, stakeholders um, to join the discussions also uh, with the commissions. There's a lot of experts today in this uh, event. Um, so I, I would really, uh, call out for for everyone to to bring in your ideas and for the commission to invite uh, many stakeholders to uh, um, uh, to give their opinion and their vision on on how this biodiversity strategy could go beyond the current uh, legislation so that we achieve uh, not just a good ecological status but that we can uh, can do more and uh, upscale our efforts uh, and uh, our ambition, ambitions in terms of uh, fresh water uh, protection and restoration. Um, I'll stop here. Uh, so please, Chris, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Aif. I just have to click a lot of boxes so I don't get wild feedback on the line as we're sharing a room. Um, thanks very much to Hans and to Aif for this uh, more in-depth look at the current state of EU legislation and, and some of the options and challenges we have going forward. I see there's been a few comments and questions coming through, including the one we mentioned before the coffee break. Uh, Hans, do you want to field a couple of those out to the speakers or to others? Sure, I can I can do that. Yeah, I uh, we are a bit over time. The panel was intended to start at twelve fifteen, but uh, begin go ahead to ask a few questions. So, yeah. um, yes. So one of the first questions we had was uh, regarding heavily modified water bodies and the restoration. Uh, so good status is not a goal for heavily modified water bodies. Rather, it's a good ecological potential. Um, so it may be more difficult in these deg more degraded rivers rivers per se to. Uh, set more ambitious targets. So the question is really, should there also be a focus on uh, more pristine, not as heavily modified water bodies, uh, or on those with more, which, which are heavily modified anyway, um, but would the latter be uh, worth more uh, from a results point of view in terms of restoring biodiversity? So that's the question for, for both Hans uh, and Eve. So if, if any of you would like to answer that, I think that's, that's fairly okay. Hans or Eve? Hans, would you like to step in? Okay, I, I have to admit that I was taking the comments while uh, Henrik was speaking, so I, I didn't hear the question. I'm very sorry. Oh, no, worries. I'll just repeat it. It's, uh, so basically, the question is whether or not focusing on, on heavily modified water bodies for restoration is, is, is worth it in the long run, since effectively we're looking at good ec ecological potential versus good ecological status. So rather focusing on, on more pristine rivers, which may not be as heavily modified, um, or on heavily modified bodies, which, which are indeed heavily modified. Uh, if it's better to focus on the latter from a results point of view for, for biodiversity restoration per se, so to, to have a more, more of an impact per se potentially. I, I, uh, I have sympathy for the question. On the other hand, the, the legislation is as it is. And uh, um, the legislation is asking the member states to either uh, go for good ecological status uh, or for good ecological potential if they think that it's not possible to, to reach the higher uh, objectives. Um, so uh, I, I, I think it's not really for me to, to comment on, on what should be the priority between those two. I, th I think the member states have the legislative framework that they have uh, and that's not going to change before 2027. So um, uh, I, I, 
yeah, I, I see there, there could be a particular attraction to move into, um, into one of the directions in order to promote more biodiversity. But uh, I, I don't think that is really within the realm of the Water Framework Directive to, to define that. Okay, thanks Hans. Yes, thanks. We, we do have one more question. I think I think we have time to just quickly. Take it. Left over on it. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one from uh, Sergey Moros of the EEB. Uh, so Sergey is asking about the zero pollution strategy expected in 2021. Uh, so this is a question for Hans uh, yourself here again. Um, it was supposed to put forward uh, action to fill the gaps identified by the Water Framework Directive fitness check. Uh, is this still the intention for the strategy to fill some of these gaps? Um, as currently there seems to be a lack of information um, in the inception impact assessment on water specific initiatives in this uh, zero pollution strategy. Very specific question, but if, if you have any... any yeah, insights. no problem. I, I, I'm happy that I can make a bit of PR for the, for the zero pollution action plan because that is the next big uh, deliverable for, uh, for, for, for us, for our directorate at least. Um, so that should be coming out sometime uh, next year, probably in the first half of next year. That is very much the intention. Um, and indeed, what we want to do is to um, to use that as an occasion, as a hook for uh, for some of the other follow-up from the fitness check of the Water Framework Directive. Um, and it's true uh, that we have not revealed much in the way of substance on the water for that zero pollution action plan, uh, but that's because we're still trying to decide what should go in there and what should not. Um, it's not the only show in town. I mean, there will also be other follow-ups, but I think an important one to mention is the, the adaptation strategy from, from Klima. Uh, that the way it looks at the moment, we think we should have a considerable water-related um, chapter dimension to it. Um, so we think that that certainly part of the fitness check follow-up can also work through that channel. Um, and, and there will also be items that flow a bit below the radar screen and, and will be part of our day-to-day -day work with um, member states and and uh, and stakeholders as part of the water framework directive implementation, but yeah, uh, at some point uh, we should be clear about what will what water related will be in zero pollution. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks a lot for for those answers. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, so uh, I'll let you take away the rest of the session, Chris, for the panel discussion. Thanks, Henry. Please do keep posting your comments. We'll, at the right moments, we'll try to bring them back on the table or bring new ones on the table. Um, the next se segment is uh, planned as a, a panel debate um, with four member state representatives. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction to each of these. The format, as I understand it, is that each will be able to give a short uh, introduction on some of the efforts that have been undergone in their own countries to restore and protect rivers. And then we have um, already shared with them some some questions that we'll we'll put to them and try and encourage a little bit of discussion between them if, if we have the time and the possibility so firstly just short introductions and apologies in advance if i uh, don't get the pronunciation of your names right <laughs> um i haven't been trained in that so i'll start with uh Sajia saya kolyonen uh, she works as a senior research scientist in the finnish environment institute's freshwater center uh, research emphasis, emphasis is on assessment of stream restoration, mitigation measures for hydropower and ecological compensation. Um, the second on my list is Daniel Roshek. He is uh, employed at the Institute for Conservation of Natural and Cultural Heritage in Nova Gorica since 1984. And there he focuses, amongst other things, on the conservation and restoration of the Socha River. We're also joined by Corinna Bilves, who works for the French Ministry for Ecological Transition, where she is the Deputy Head of Unit in charge of aquatic environment and freshwater experience. And finally, but no mean least, is uh, Fernando Magdaleno. He is the Deputy Director for Water Protection and Risks Management at the Ministry for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge, Demographic Challenge in Spain, and advisor to the Spanish Water Director on the implementation of EU water directives. So I'm sure you'll agree this is a, a very rich and worthy panel for what we're planning. Um, I'd like to now invest, invite uh, Sasha without further ado, Saya without further ado, to give her a short uh, introduction to river protection and restoration in Finland. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, well, I wanted to start with a question about um, what is your own, uh, for each of you, uh, your first, uh, first impression of Finland. Uh, many of you might say that we have a lot of good quality waters and uh, we must be happy ones. So that uh, I will be just be proudly presenting here the model member of EU uh, and how we handle everything. But you can relax now. <laughs> I will present some challenges also. Uh, next one, please. Uh, so my statement is our environment, our history and societal aspects define our possibilities to reach the goals with healthy rivers. Uh, well, yes, most of our rivers in Finland are already in a good ecological status and yes, we have a lot of water. Uh, but I want to highlight our history and show you that the change in Finland uh, was really rapid and it happened actually just after the World War II. Uh, you can see the graph and the rapid loss of uh, free-flowing rivers after the 1940s in Finland. Uh, Finland was not a competitive society until we actually had to pay our uh, reparations or war debt to the Soviet Union and develop our country really fast. Uh, so the highly needed energy production was made by hydropower and we lost all of our major rivers totally at that time. And because it was socially so important, there were no mitigation measures or obligations uh, for hydropower companies. And all of our hydropower permits became set as eternal. So we are stuck with that history and this legal limitation now. Uh, but you see, this hydropower development reached it, its bottom in the 1980s. And uh, I could say, as the oil capacity was already used by then, uh, but nowadays, right now, we have only one plant, new hydropower plant in the whole country. And I feel our society in Finland is ready to talk about dam removals right now. Uh, well, one extra uh, cultural challenge in Finland, maybe a very Finnish one, is that we still tend to live from nature so that uh, fishing for recreation means also food in Finland. Uh, over 30% of all of our uh, citizens go fishing and gillnetting is still very popular. So combining these challenges and history, uh, especially our migratory fish stocks are really in trouble. Next one, please. Uh, so for us, I would say that uh, what should be done is kind of a paradigm shift. Uh, I mentioned concern with our migratory fish. We talk a lot about uh, a lot about uh, salmon and trout, uh, but from single species or single aspects, we would need to go widen our so scope and think the ecosystems. Uh, it sounds obvious to all of you, I think, but it's not yet happening. In Finland, political will reach this salmon and trout, not yet the ecosystems. Uh, so my second statement could be that we would need to give value for nature, uh, value for just being there, not the value we give them, give the nature when we use it, like ecosystem services. That means a lot of new ambition and political will, and I could also add that long-lasting political will. Uh, next one, please. Uh, but I see no hope. Uh, with this uh, EU biodiversity strategy and in our common will to implement it. I'm sorry I didn't go quite deep to the restoration theme, but uh, this was my uh, historical statement. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Saya. That's okay. I'm, I'm sure we'll get a rich set of presentations and it's interesting to see this sort of context and background to, from which you have to work. It's quite informative, I think. Um, without further ado, I'd like to invite our next uh, panelist, Danielle Roshek. Danielle, are you, are you available? Are you ready to start? Can you see him? Hello to everyone. Thanks ah. for the presentation. I will, I will shortly touch the most degraded banks of the Socha River between Kovarit and Pulmir. Next. Thanks, Daniel. Just one second. Is there any chance you could speak harder or up the volume? I see several drowning, drowning faces. People can't hear you so well. Uh -huh. Can you hear you, me good or not? That's a little bit better. Better? Even better. Better now? <laughs> I Is think that's good? okay. I see uh, less frowns now. 
Please go next, ahead. Uh, next slide, please. The Socha River um, springs in the center of Julian Alps and after 140 kilometers long course flows into the northern Adriatic Sea. She, because all rivers in Slovenia are female, is the most beautiful river on the earth due to the exceptional color and of the water and other natural phenomena. The upper part and uh, a part of the middle course together 35 kilometers was proclaimed a natural monument in 1992. The other part of the middle course is degraded with the three artificial lakes for the hydroelectric plants in Slovenia and the lower one with four in Italy. I will only touch the lower part of the natural monument between Kobarit and Tulmin, which is about 20 kilometers long. Um, there the water administration. This is Slovenia was very hard for rivers in the past. Now it's a little bit better. They allowed gravel and sand extraction in four places before the proclam pro 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 proclamation of the monument. They protected the banks uh, against uh, the site erosion a decade ago in two places with big rocks and fasten these rocks with wooden poles, which now look like a fence between water and land. Horrible. And then third half, three and a half decades ago, they built 500 meters long rock embankment and cut a meander from living water. Next slide, please. This is the map where these degraded um, river banks are shown that this uh, river meander in the uh, little bit and this four gravel and sand extraction places. Next one, please. This uh, section of the Socha River starts here near Kobari. This is a really amazing place. Next one, please. This is this protection of the riverbank with big rocks and these wooden poles. Next, please. This is like a fence, horrible. Such a beautiful river and such a fence that this, that this need to go together. Please, next one. And about restoration, Protecting of the banks against erosion degrades the river, and it is also very expensive. It would be significantly better to pay, to buy at least a five meter zone along the river banks and let the river run free. It would also be cheaper. But water administration, this is the long term. The water administration could, in a relatively short time, close three or four gravel and sand extraction places, which have gravel separation in the protected area of the Socha River. That's a lot of dust and, and, and noise and very bad situation. And then restored degraded river banks with more appropriate structure and allow flow through the meander. That's in short. Thank you for your attention. So to the next slide. Bye. Thanks, Daniel. That's a very nice analysis of the issues facing the, the Socha River. Indeed, some really beautiful images. Uh, very interesting to hear that this is one of the oldest protected rivers in Europe as well, going back way, way before the Water Framework Directive. But, uh, I'll move on to the next presentation, and I have uh, Corinna Belvez from the Ministry of Ecological Transition in France as the next speaker. Corinna, I hope you're, you're ready to go. Um, yeah, thank you. Chris, do you hear me? I hear you okay. I think uh, you're okay, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to present the Legal Friends uh, Framework about uh, 
uh, river restoration and uh, continuity. Um, the French framework um, contains several legal provisions um, about uh, river and uh, the management, for instance, on min minimum biological flows. Uh, but uh, I will focus today on uh, maybe what's more relevant to the EU biodiversity strategy, uh, meaning uh, our main legal provision on, uh, on river continuity, uh, which is that we have a, a classification of river. Um, this classification uh, is two sides. We have uh, uh, two categories that are least one rivers, which are protected. So these rivers uh, need to be protected because they have either a very good ecological status or are a biological reservoir or are a migration axis. So uh, on them, there are no new obstacles may be built. Uh, we have a second category of rivers, which are so-called least two rivers. So these rivers are to be restored. Uh, so on this river, we require the, the legal framework requires a free flow of fishes and sufficient flow of sediments. So uh, on these rivers, obstacles are to be taken care of within five to ten years. So this represents around 11% of rivers. Um, and these two provisions, least one rivers and least, least two rivers, uh, were drafted in the French law in 2006, but uh, they were inspired by former requirements in French law dating back for some of them to uh, the 19th century. So, for instance, we have a requirement to implement fish ladders on new wells dating back to 1865. Um, but it was introduced in 2006 and actual implementation started in 2010. Uh, our biggest obstacles to this uh, policy, because now we, we have quite some experience about this, uh, this policy, uh, was uh, to reconcile this policy of river continuity with other important policies. So we already discussed about hydropower and renewable energies, but we also have uh, currently in France um, a strong um, reconciliation work with uh, heritage preservation and notably water mills and also fish farming and uh, renewable developments. So actually we, we still face a, a tough opposition to, to the policy uh, coming from uh, these uh, actors, these stakeholders. And we implemented in 2018 uh, a national rec reconciliation action plan uh, to try to find solutions uh, to, to reconcile these different policy objectives. So this plan is still in progress. And uh, basically, it, um, it, it, uh, it is made of uh, uh, a strategy to find solutions uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, taking into account local context and issues and seeing how uh, uh, solutions can be found at local level. So um, we, it takes time and um, even if we have in France quite uh, uh, considerable funding, uh, we still uh, face serious uh, difficulties in uh, implementing it. So um, I think we, if we, we come to what could be the way to optimize restoration and protection efforts, um, based on our experience, I think the key would be, we already touched on it, uh, prioritization of uh, the wares and dams to be addressed. Um, when we, we started, we prioritized rivers, but uh, then ended with the 100,000 barriers to be tackled. So we, it was a lot and we had to make a second prioritization uh, at the level of the wear itself. And at the moment we are focusing, so with the second prioritization on 5,000 wares to be addressed by 2027. So 
it's already a lot and uh, these wells were really crucial from an uh, ecological perspective or they were low hanging fruit wells. So it's still a very challenging deadline to tackle them all by 2027. So, so to conclude, I think the EU biodiversity strategy for us is an opportunity to, to implement uh, better these uh, French uh, legal requirements and also to recall the raison d'etre of this policy and all its benefits because sometimes they are questioned by stakeholders and uh, so we we would like to to thank the European Commission for integrating it in the in the biodiversity strategy. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Karina, for that uh, nice uh, outline of the situation as you see it in France. And you've answered several of the questions that we posed as well, which gives us some nice material to discuss. Uh, we get a little bit of discussion time now. I'd like to quickly move to our last uh, presenter. That will be. Fernando Magdaleno from the Ministry of Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge in Spain. Fernando, I hope you're ready. I, I see your presentation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much to everyone for being here today with me. And to see my, my slides, which are presenting the, the current dynamics of restoration of rivers in Spain and some of our efforts to, to conserve and to protect our uh, best protected uh, uh, river sites in, in the country. There are just a few slides to illustrate my, my words, so I will try to show you that uh, our main effort is to uh, preserve and restore uh, all kinds of water bodies under our uh, current national strategy for river restoration. So we have one national strategy which tries to bring together all the efforts which are being put into development in the different basins to, to better coordinate all these kind of uh, different uh, projects, analyses, studies, and all the actions which are being taken. One of the axes of this strategy uh, is uh, related to conservation of the, of the most pristine sites in the country, including uh, river uh, sites, lake sites, and groundwaters, which we understand are also a major component of the, of the water uh, cycle, of the, of the water system. So this image is showing the present uh, situation of all the sites which are uh, protected already in Spain and those which are being discussed um, to increase the protection, the number of, of sites and the length of the, of the overall system, which is uh, under this consideration of protected area where any kind of pressure uh, can be uh, developed. So uh, a big effort is being put into this. Uh, for each of those sites, uh, be them rivers, lakes, or groundwaters, there will be management uh, plans and programs to uh, improve the condition of these sites. Even uh, they are quite pristine, but they have some pressures, uh, of course, and uh, to uh, create a good coordination of the whole system to make uh, bit by bit these uh, into uh, river corridors and systems which are better connected in space and in time. So this is about the protection of the, of the best preserved sites. And also we have a good number of initiatives which are related to uh, providing uh, higher connectivity to rivers in terms of uh, lateral connectivity, uh, connectivity in the, in the longitudinal uh, axis. And this could include, for instance, the removal of a wide number of uh, small dams and weirs. We have already deleted, removed, almost 300 small dams and weirs in the country, which is still a small portion of the overall number of them uh, all along Spain. But uh, it's something important because it creates a change of a shift in the paradigm uh, of the past in, in the country where there were so many thousands of dams and small weirs all around the, the rivers. Uh, in some cases, removal is not possible. So we have to, uh, to apply a reconnection by means of different uh, fish passes, fish ladders, and like in this example, which was uh, very recently created in Madrid, one uphill flow rock grab to allow uh, the use of, uh, of water in that uh, small dam, but also to provide a, a, a good uh, passage to barbels, which in this case is dominant species in the river. So this is an example of how we are trying to move despite all the uh, legal, technical and social uh, constraints which are always difficult to, to cope with. Next, please. 
Another example of uh, this uh, attempt to improve the connectivity of our rivers uh, are those actions which are aimed to um, uh, restoring the lateral connectivity of those places which were in the past channelized or defended with uh, levees, uh, embankments, or any other kind of uh, flood defense. In this case, there is a wide number of uh, examples uh, when rivers have been channelized or the artificial levees or banks which were protecting the uh, uh, lateral uses are being removed, like in this example. This is in northern Spain, in Navarre region, which is in the Ebro, uh, in the Ebro Basin. In this case, the project, which was part of a, an interreg and one life a big project, consisted of eliminating uh, several uh, tens of kilometers of artificial levees and using the sediment which was uh, under or was, was uh, basing those defenses, it was to reintroduce sediments into the river. So we took the same sediment which was in the past dredged and used for creating the, the embankments. Now it was taken uh, away of the, of the riparian areas and was reintroduced in the riverbed to give a uh, better equilibrium between liquid flows and solid flows in, in the, the whole river. So this is one example of sediment augmentation and there are other cases which are also being studied or applied in the similar way in other uh, places of the, of the country. Next, please. I also want to highlight the, our efforts to, uh, to apply uh, NWRMs uh, in also in Spain, different basins, uh, following the recommendations of the European Commission. And these kind of uh, measures uh, are being applied both in rural and in urban areas. In rural areas, for instance, here also in the one big river of the Ebro uh, Basin, this is the Aragon River near, near France. This is an example of floodplain excavation, uh, which was uh, disconnected from the main stem because of the incision of the channel due to different pressures, including river regulation, occupation of margins, and excavation for, um, for mining. And uh, there was one disconnection between the riverbed and the floodplain, which was uh, partially mitigated by excavating the floodplain by, by taking away, as I was saying before, all the different uh, defenses which were uh, creating that condition of disconnection between the, the floodplain and the main riverbed. So this is another one example uh, of something which was uh, working very well. There was no major inconvenience. It, uh, uh, it uh, required a large uh, negotiation with different uh, users of the water and users of the river margins. But finally, it was uh, quite successful and it was a good example of collaboration between uh, water authorities and regional government in this area of, of the country. Next, please. Another uh, example of uh, the application of those measures in city places is an example of floodable parks, which are also being considered in different cities uh, in Spain, which are um, green areas in the, in the urban matrix, which uh, can be flooded and which is following a bit that idea of the cities, of the spawn cities, those cities which are capable of coping better with runoff and to avoid that the runoff which is uh, being uh, boosted by the uh, urban agglomeration uh, is not impacting so much the river system and uh, is not so damaging for the overall functioning of the uh, river network. This is one example in Alicante, this is in the, in the coastal area near Valence and uh, it's uh, a park which has already been working well in the last uh, flat events and the, this is a place where there are big rainfall in, in late summer so it has already worked very well in those situations avoiding the flooding of the city and uh, avoiding uh, and this balance of uh, uh, yes of the water cycle in the city yeah I'm just finishing uh, Chris don't worry <laughs> just a couple more and uh, just a small remark about uh, flows also there are many efforts to improve E flows in the country, and also we are trying to uh, boost one measure which we understand is very important for med rivers, and this is control floods. These are experimental floods which are uh, released in the rivers from the reservoirs to regenerate and to uh, refresh 
uh, river dynamics downstream of these big reservoirs. In this of control flats, which we have already had like seven, eight examples in the in the country, you can see the sites in the in the map. Uh, in some cases, we have coupled, we have combined the release of the flats with sediment again reintroduction to uh, better balance again the water, the liquid flows and the solid flows downstream of the big reservoirs. And uh, finally, and also important, we are also working very much on uh, reconnecting people with rivers by a large number of campaigns and actions which are trying to promote recreational uses in the rivers and also to promote and to, uh, to enhance and to boost all kind of uh, collaborations, stewardships and uh, river contracts between water users, the people who are attracted by, by the magic of, of rivers and administrations. So also the social part is a major component which we are trying to, 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 to work very much in and we hope it can be a, a major axis also of our policies in the future. And that's all, so thanks, sorry for the, for such a quick presentation, and I'll be very happy to, to respond to any question in the, in the debate. Thanks, Fernando, that was really very inspiring. Lots of uh, great action on the ground and, and change that's been taking place in Spain over the last years. The plan was to have a short uh, set of questions, a round of questions which we had pre-prepared. Um, of course, we're running a little over time now, if you're all happy to stay with us, perhaps for another 10 minutes, I can at least uh, farm out a couple of questions to the speakers that we had pre, we pre-warned them about to, to get a little bit more deepening of, of the cases they've given. Um, maybe if I start with, um, well, pretty much a similar question to Saya and, and to Danielle. You both uh, gave a bit of context and you highlighted some of the, the obstacles that you're facing. Um, Daniel, you talked about past uh, land decisions in, on the Sochi River and how you have an unfortunate situation at the moment. And <clears throat> Sajay, you, you spoke about the history and the way that rivers have been managed in the past and that you're confronted with how to overturn this now. How, how do you see coming over these obstacles? Do you have some examples or ideas on how you'll take these issues forward going into the future or perhaps evidence from what you've done? I know, Sajay, you've done quite a lot in Finland in terms of... Uh, thinking of these issues. So it would be good to hear a bit more. Either Danielle or Sandra. Um, yes, in Finland, I, I think the biggest obstacle might be the Water Act. We actually have because it, it is not, uh, it's not for water protection, it is because of water use. So it, uh, the basis of the Water Act is uh, like uh, really difficult for us. Uh, but I, uh, there is a lot of talk about now uh, changing it and uh, these obligations for hydropower producers are really old and uh, we are going to make them uh, renew them and uh, they are not functional and uh, I was actually quite happy if I could say that Corinne told us about uh, waiting for 150 years of, in the fish way in one case because we have been waiting in some cases uh, really long those uh, obligations to implement and uh, so it, it is nice that we have such a it's not our problem only yeah it's, it's good to hear that well not good to hear but there are shared problems across yeah. the countries that's for sure and, and Danielle how, how do you see the obstacles that you're facing you have this, these fixed constructions in the river and past decisions uh, and you can see what you need to do but um, what are the obstacles and does um, the, if you like, the policy developments at EU level and that presumably filter down to your national government, do they offer you hope that you can overcome these? You need to put your microphone off. That's yes. good. Can you hear me? Whoop. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Yeah, there are three big dams of the four hydroelectric plan plants. And in December 2018, I wrote the first proposal to take off these three dams. And I hope that this will happen in not a short, but in long term future, because there is a lack of energy and um, water energy is so-called 
uh, renewable and clear energy, but this is not true. It's renewable, it's really for a part because um, rain is coming again and this, this, this is a renewable source, but lakes, these reservoirs are filled with gravel and when it's filled up, there is no more chance to produce energy. And um, we will find a new energy sources, not this water energy. So I hope that this will happen in my life to, to take off these three dams. Because the, the Socha River is also very beautiful in this part of the middle and lower course, which is um, obstacle with these dams. And there is also a problem because the half of the river is in Italy and the Italian policy is quite different. They use water for irrigation. And Socha close of the border is in summer like a small stream because all water is used for irrigation. And you know the the the, the food production is in the first steps. So we will hope we'll, we'll in the future, they, they change cultures, uh, 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 crops we do not need so much water because maize and, and uh, the other uh, water consumption, consumption plants are not suitable for such a sub-Mediterranean region which is uh, dry during during summers and this i hope will will um, will happen in 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 the future thanks very much uh, daniel i'd like to turn then to uh, perhaps corinna and to fernando um if we listen to the different um, narratives i mean we, we see some common issues that there's a lot of history to how rivers have been planned and managed and there's a lot of factors that might feel out of the control of people concerned with implementation of water and nature conservation policies. So uh, you have dams, you have irrigation, uh, past management decisions. Um, certainly Fernando shows a lot of uh, grounds for optimism in what have they been able to do in Spain going forward. And Corinna, you also highlighted that uh, there's ways and means to get your agenda forward by prioritizing and focusing. Um, do you have anything more to share on looking forward, um, how we can further optimize restoration and protection? How do we get past what we've done to taking things even further to scale? Um, because even though you've done a lot there, Fernando, you say, well, we have 300 uh, infrastructure pieces removed, but there's a fraction of what needs to happen. So how do we go from the good beginnings that some of us are experiencing to something at larger scale, which should be something we need to do under the Water Framework Directive combined with the biodiversity strategy? From my side, I think we have um, uh, begun uh, our path. We have begun to do uh, important things, but still that small portion of the total number of pressures of problems for rivers, I was mentioning we have uh, removed uh, maybe 300 uh, small dams, and we have maybe 30,000. So it's, it's a small percentage, but it's creating a, a new condition uh, for discussion. Now it's possible to show people that this is uh, possible to do, that it's uh, working quite well. So these uh, examples are good for communicating people which are the, uh, maybe the main benefits and the, and the main uh, cons also of, of uh, making those kind of actions. But it's very important to communicate our efforts, our results, and to translate these kind of actions into things which people can understand very well in terms of ecosystem services, in terms of uh, recovery of the water cycle, even for uh, uh, farmers, even for urban users. We have, to, we have to, to have the ability of translating these sometimes uh, technical and very ecological things into a language which can be understood by the majority of people in different uh, segments of the social sphere and under different uh, conditions. So our maybe our main challenge now is to improve communication and to use and to use those preliminary successful examples 
into something which is understood and can then be uh, transferred to a major or, or to a higher number of uh, basins and sites in, in the country. That's a very nice and very clear point. Thanks, Fernando. And Corinda, do you have any reflections on that? You spoke yourself about opposition from heritage and fish farming groups, for instance. Is this a secret, clearer communication? Yeah, thank you. I totally agree with Fernando that uh, communication is key and it's currently one of our main challenges right now. Um, so it's part of what we are doing. We're also trying to design tools uh, that can be used at local level to to feed uh, the, the way that the solutions can be found. But uh, still, it's uh, it's very challenging, and uh, I'm happy to see that in Spain we have uh, the same uh, situation in uh, in some ways. Okay, th thanks very much, Karina. We're really running short of time. We're we're about twenty minutes beyond where we wanted to be. So I think, if I'm just checking, should we? round this off. I think we probably should give everyone a bit of a break now. It, it's, it's quite tiring concentrating for this period of time and I'm happy to see we've actually retained nearly everybody from the start of the call. So we'd like to keep your energy and interest for the second half of the seminar this afternoon where we'll go a bit more into some of the more specific tools, uh, issues that we think we need to tackle going forward and we'll also give a particular focus upon the Western Balkans and look at some of the issues in uh, one of the EU's neighbouring areas. Um, so for now, um, please have a nice break um, and we plan to be back online, if I get the time right, at, oh, where's my agenda, at um, quarter to one, so in about 40 minutes. Okay, thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've, uh, those of us who were with us before the break have had a, a nice lunch break. Um, we'd like to uh, continue with the agenda for this afternoon. Um, for anybody who has joined the session only for this afternoon, uh, I'm your moderator, Chris Baker. I work for Weapons International. Um, we have a series of presentations this afternoon on tools for river conservation. We're going to zoom in on the Western Balkans and some issues there around some of the European scale important rivers and the issues they're facing. And then we'll reflect our forward onto outlook and challenges ahead. Um, just for those who haven't been with us before, if you have questions or so, please, please pop them in the chat box. And our colleague from uh, the Nature Conservancy, Henrik, is going to organize those. And as we get the opportunity, we try to put them back into the discussion or to the speakers. So let's, without further ado, move on to the next segment of the program, which is looking at tools for river conservation, funding, designations, and definitions. Uh, the first uh, presentation up is uh, one I'm particularly excited to hear from is on the money flow financing restoration. And we're going to be uh, led through this by Wouter Helmer and Helena Newell, both of Rewilding Europe. Wouter is uh, one of the founders of uh, Rewilding Europe, currently acting as a senior advisor. And he's uh, on behalf of Rewilding, of Rewilding Europe, he's involved in Dam Removal Europe, another initiative uh, regarding exploration of financial models for dam removal. And Helena is uh, Rewilding Europe's enterprise manager and, and is tasked with identifying and supporting rewilding enterprises and investment management of Rewilding Europe Capital, REC, which is the loan facility of Rewilding Europe. Now, we've seen the issue of resourcing and financing popping up throughout this morning's presentation. So I think it's uh, going to be with great interest we look to hear from Wouter and from Helena. So Wouter or Helena, whoever's going to start, I'll give you the floor. Yep, let's see if it works. Share the screen. Yep, you can see it now? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay. There we are. Okay, thank you, Chris, for offering this opportunity to present uh, the financial models for river restoration. As you see here, the, this presentation focuses on dam removal, as this appeared to be one of the most efficient ways to restore rivers. And we uh, do this research on behalf of Rewild Europe, partner in this Dam Removal Europe consortium, which already has a lot of experience in dam removal by crowdfunding campaigns, by project funding, but we're talking about tens of thousands of dysfunctional and obsolete dams in Europe. So if we really want to have impact, we also should develop financial models for scaling up uh, dam removal. And that's what uh, we as Rewild Europe has worked on the last year, uh, um, partly funded and supported by WWF, have we done a short exploration of potential models for dam removal to scale this uh, up. Uh, here you see the, the, the range of uh, possibilities we have explored. Because of the time limitations, I will only discuss a few of them just to give you a flavor of uh, the, the different models we are um, exploring. Um, uh, well, th those five I will discuss in the in the coming next minutes. I don't know what's popping up now in the middle of the screen, but it's not from my side. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, the first one is an obvious one. Of course, you can imagine that by removing dams, you really can boost populations of migratory fish, trout, salmon, which could be the basis for a new economy in the, in a region. And of course, uh, needless to say, if that's not an extractive fishing economy, but based on catch and release, then this could both boost uh, populations of, uh, of migratory fish and at the same time um, create an economy that could um, yeah, pay for the removal of the next dams in, this, in, the, in the same area. This model actually, actually that we are at this moment um, implementing in the northern part of, uh, of Sweden. Um, so to make this work, you, you need uh, local partners, local authorities, or local organizations of fishermen that are allowed to manage the system of catch and release and that can use the benefits to uh, remove dams in the, in the system. Um, just a side remark here, uh, removing dams uh, in this way is really much more effective than 
building then by them very expensive fish ladders that from now we know that they are only useful for a small number of uh, fish species. Um, and next model is um, to substitute uh, dams by other sources of renewable energy like wind power and uh, solar parks. And if, especially if uh, governments only order permits for windmills in the, in, and link them to removal of, uh, of dams, that could be very efficient. Um, especially for the smaller dams, up to 20 megawatts, they can already be replaced by one or two windmills. Um, and uh, and when you make local people owners of those windmills or solar parks, of course, then it becomes also very attractive for them uh, to, uh, yeah, to substitute the, their dams by uh, windmills and solar parks. I don't know what's happening with you, but there's a figure popping up in my screen. I don't know the... Yeah, we've, we've just, um, we're trying to do something about it, uh, about it. Someone apparently managed to hack into the system and there's... Uh... If okay. I could draw something on the screen, I hope we can uh, sort that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least somebody has fun at this moment. Um, <laughs> then um, a third one, maybe that's a more complex one. Um, we know from some rivers in, in Europe that downstream they cause, the dams cause problems because, they, as, as you understand, sometimes they keep a lot of sediments behind the dam and that sediment is at that time not available in the mouth of the rivers to build up uh, the coastal system or the and um, sometimes water managers make a lot of costs with the um, uh, sand uh, replenishment in the in the mouth of the river costs that maybe can be avoided when the same amount of money is used to remove the dam upstream so that the dam brings the sediment for free um, in that case of course you uh, uh, you need partnerships with water managers, um, authorities that are responsible for safe riverbanks, coastal defense. And that's, uh, but this is, this is a measure on the on catchment level, which uh, we know could be helpful in uh, some French rivers. I know there's an ex example already in Sweden for this um, approach. And this uh, yeah, could also be a, a solution, an economic solution to remove dams um, by saving costs elsewhere. Then, um, buying and obtaining dams and remove them could be interesting in regions or countries where governments have a subsidy system in place for privately owned dams especially when they are they are obsolete and cause a risk downstream uh, if they break in those um, uh, situations um, you can of course uh, you can invest in buying dams removing them knowing that afterwards you will be paid back by governmental money. And this is now that this system is now working mainly on an ad hoc basis. And um, uh, hey, thank you very much. Um, but that could change in a proactive strategy if you have uh, a pre-finance uh, um, opportunity or if you can have a loan to buy them, take them out and as I said, Get the payment back from the government afterwards. So this is a model um, for something that is now again in Sweden very attractive. Helena will tell more about that later this uh, this presentation. And in this case you can you have to cooperate with dam owners uh, probably with the uh, demolition companies and water authorities that have this financial system in place. And the last one which is uh, especially in, in some regions in Eastern Europe the case where really big dams flooded large areas, sometimes of thousands of hectares. Um, the value of those flooded lands can, in the current situation, maybe outweigh the value of the dam. And then um, uh, dam removal uh, could be combined with sustainable development of those floodplains. You can imagine that by um, developing these areas again for agricultural, for forestry, or for attractive nature areas with uh, nature-based tourism, you can build an economy that can be more important for the region than the value of the, the dam itself. And then you can think about partnerships with nature organizations, farmers, foresters, and the tourism sector, and so on, to create an alternative economy for the hydropower at the moment. Um, well, we are at this moment doing a kind of quick scan of these 
potential financial models, look which partners should be uh, approached, what are the regions in Europe that are most suitable for the different models, and what is the likelihood of successful implementation in these areas. So that's uh, what we're currently doing, but means that the next steps are uh, per country, explore the enabling conditions for dam removal, the policies, legislation, financial models that are there. This is currently done by Martin Redding, our dam removal researcher. He's also attending this uh, conference, by the way. He's making an uh, overview of all the European countries and their uh, policies and strategies for, uh, for dam removal. From his experience, from his uh, matrix he's making, and the models I just uh, explained that we are exploring, we choose the most promising models. Then we look in, in which areas we can find early adopters for one or more of these models. And Elena will tell more about the case in Sweden that we are exploring at the moment. Then with those partners, further develop these models and uh, see uh, yeah, how they can be scaled up. First, test them on a small scale. Um, we have indeed a, a loan facility in place, Rewound Europe Capital, which is supported by the European Investment Bank, uh, currently containing uh, 6 million euros, for which we can up to 600,000 euros issue loans to um, yeah, partners for removing dams. Can be as a pre finance and, uh, in a kind of revolving fund, could also be a commercial loan. That's all depends on the, on the case. And if we find really scalable options, then we can attract investors even for a, a larger uh, loan facility. That's a short introduction from my side. And now Helena will take over with the Swedish example. Hi, thanks, Valter. I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Is Valter, is the sound coming through okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Fine. okay, great. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so just as um, Valter mentioned, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes um, explaining the opportunity that we're currently exploring in Sweden um, before opening uh, the floor to questions. So I think first of all is just to think about the context that we're looking in, in Sweden. So the Swedish government has um, determined that there's a need for all small-scale hydropower and all small-scale dams to be um, relicensed um, between 2022 and 2026. 2036 under the national province plan owners uh, therefore have the opportunity either to choose between implementing new environmental mitigation measures or to de decommissioning their plant and this applies for somewhere between 1500 and 1600 dams across across sweden in order to support this transition the, uh, the hydropower environmental fund has been established by the eight largest hydropower companies in Sweden with access to up to a billion euros, um, which can be used to uh, refund the costs that are um, that are incurred through through implementing these measures. So the fund and and through that they'll repay up between the 85 and 95 percent of the costs. Um, of implementing the measures, um, but they'll only repay that um, once those costs have been incurred. So there's still a need to actually pre-finance some of these um, some of these measures to be implemented. Therefore, given this context and the supporting kind of the enabling uh, conditions that have been created in Sweden, we think this is an unprecedented and um, significant opportunity because this relicensing is probably once in a 50 year. Um, potentially a uh, time frame uh, that the dams will then need to be relicensed. So we think it's a real opportunity to remove large numbers of dams across Sweden, restore fish migration, rewild the rivers and start improving their ecological condition. So what are we actually doing to try and take advantage of this opportunity? So we're working with Alvadana, the river saviors in Sweden, about how to maximize uh, the potential for this opportunity. Um, we're currently working on developing a pilot which proves a model on, on a small scale and then hopefully within the next 15 years we can scale that across Sweden um, to remove large numbers of dams. So at this stage we're, we're in a relatively early stage of this exploration um, but we envisage that a, a new company could be created that would implement the following process in the pilot and then hopefully look to scale that opportunity. 
So first of all, it would involve identifying priority dams that want to be that um, should be removed, hopefully. And um, that prioritization will focus on kind of ecological value of the removal, um, the opportunity for rewilding the rivers, but also on which which dams are scheduled for relicensing early in this 15 year period. So the first dams um, will need to apply for the relicensing in February 2022 and then in September 2022. And we want to focus on those kind of early stage um, dam, dams within uh, within the pilot. So once we've identified the dams, we'll then um, undertake identify the owners of the dams and start discussions to see what their um, preferences at the moment of whether they're looking to remove the dams or whether they're looking to implement environmental mitigations. If they're looking to, re to remove the dams themselves, we believe that there's an opportunity for this new company to act as consultancy to really help the owner apply to the Hydropower um, Environmental Fund to, um, to access those funds that we discussed, as well as potentially to access additional funds that will cover the shortfall that's not covered by the uh, Hydropower Environmental Fund. If the owner is not then interested in, in dam removal, um, we believe that that's the opportunity where we may or the company may um, take take ownership of the dam, negotiate with the owner and purchase the dam, run the dam until the date for relicensing, if, if appropriate, if it's still in operation, and then um, remove and then remove the dam ourselves recouping the costs from the Hydropower Environmental Fund. We believe this combined approach will allow us to maximise the number of dams that are removed within the pilot and then hopefully the scaled business um, as it enables us to focus, um, just raise the pre-finance required where the, the owner themselves is not interested in removing the dam. So, um, there are still a number of elements that we need to determine uh, in order to take this concept into implementation. We're currently trying to establish exactly how the details of the company will function, where we could potentially raise this finance um, for, um, uh, for the pre-finance in order to remove the dams and some of the options that Valter mentioned are, are opportunities. Um, determining exactly how we can access the funds from the Hydropower Environmental Fund and ultimately, is there an opportunity to actually create a sustainable business which generates revenue and a return potentially to make it truly kind of scalable? Due to the time frame of um, the, the relicensing, we, as I mentioned, the earliest ones being in February 2022, we, we need to uh, move quickly. So we're hoping to establish some of these, um, to clarify some of these in, these details in the next couple of months with a more detailed plan, hopefully by uh, beginning of um, 2021. And um, then we can actually start working on the pilot and actually start removing the dams. So that is a very short um, overview of the context and opportunity that we're exploring. Um, hopefully that gives you a taste of what we're looking into, uh, but I wanted to leave enough time for questions. So I'll hand back to Chris and Henrik to, to manage that. Thanks, Elena. That's really clear. A really nice uh, pair of uh, presentations, which really highlight some new and interesting ways to try and resource, uh, improve river connectivity and restoration. Yeah, I would love some questions. I We've asked people to um, use the chat box. Um, we haven't had so many questions in yet. Um, Henrik, do you see anything? You, I can't track them all. Do you want to? Do you see anything you want to ask now, or should we? Yes, take uh, we, do, we do have a quick question. I suppose we could take. Uh, we're running a bit over time, but it's about hydropower as an energy source, uh, source as an alternative um, to wind and solar. So the question really concerns the balancing of these renewable energy solutions and countries where wood and solar is not potentially viable or not making an entry, or it's it's not seen as an alternative uh, due to various reasons. Um, what about these hydropower plants is the question. I mean, do, does, does that kind of balance still need to be uphold where hydropower plants are still in place uh, as a solution where other options aren't like solar and wind aren't necessarily uh, a thing, also touching on things like nuclear and, uh, and obviously non-renewables as well. So that's the question I received. Is that uh, Wouter or Helena? Yeah, I can give a quick response. So I think important is that we don't consider hydropower any longer as green energy. It's really harming our river systems. And so having said that, so 
in any place where wind power or solar power can be an alternative, yeah, we should really consider this option. Of course, if that's not the case, we should look for other options or just leave it as it is. So it's not, um, so, so the, the, the reason for this exercise we did is just to explore all kinds of opportunities that we see to uh, substitute uh, um, hydropower by, by other economies. But yeah, it's, it, will not, it will not be a, a, a solution for, for every case. So anytime we should see what is the most efficient way to, uh, to move forward. And that could be with wind and solar uh, substitution, but in other areas, it's, maybe it's the, the fish economy or the sediment angle that we will choose or just leave it as it is. So it's, uh, it's just to, to, to create a, a toolkit for, for dam removers, more or less. Thanks for taking that question quickly, Wouter. Um, I would have hundreds actually, but I wish <laughs> we had more time. Um, maybe we can come bring a few back in in the course of the afternoon if you're able to, to stay with us, but time is pressing and uh, I need to invite Tara Moberg from Nature Conservancy to the next uh, presentation. I'll try and keep my questions in my head. Um, yeah. Tara, if I just give you a short introduction, um, you're the Senior Freshwater Advisor, Energy Infrastructure at the Nature Conservancy in the US. Uh, you've got a background as a freshwater scientist on ecosystem flow research, policy, water and energy and land use. And you're going to talk to us now a bit about durable river protection designations and the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, as I think a little bit of inspiration for how we might go further within the field of European policy and legislation. But let's see. Thank you, Tara. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Hopefully others can too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> except for the person who's um, bombing our, our Zoom call. <laughs> I think we've, uh, we've shut the door on them now. So. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much for this opportunity um, to, to be with you today to learn. I'm sorry that I wasn't able to join this morning, I'm joining you from the eastern um, part of the US, and so it was quite early, the start. But when I looked at the agenda, um, all of the issues that are being discussed in the European context, including the most recent issue that Walter and Helena presented on, on the opportunity for using hydropower mitigation uh, to fund both uh, river restoration and protection are, um, are such salient points. Um, challenge of finding opportunities for clean energy deployment and alternatives to new dams, um, both for hydropower, flood control, and, and the like. So the focus of my, convert, my um, talk today is really going to be on um, the protection piece and mechanisms to ensure that once we've removed a dam or restored a river, that we are managing and have systems in place to conserve the values of that river um, over the long term. And I, I think as um, most folks on this call are intimately aware, uh, freshwater ecosystems are the most threatened and least protected of our Earth's systems. So we know that one in three freshwater species is at risk of extinction. The recent report that was spearheaded by World Fish Migration Foundation, we participated in with others on the, uh, the status of freshwater migratory fish populations in the world found that on average, there's been a reduction of 76% uh, globally, and that, that percentage is higher in Europe um, than from, for many parts of the world. We know uh, from the recent Living Planet Index published and led by WWF that freshwater populations have reduced on, been reduced on average by 86% globally, and that's much higher than terrestrial and marine biomes. And so when we're thinking about um, freshwater protection, there's obviously a, a context that we're working within and that will look differently depending on where you are in the world and the level of development um, in play at uh, today. So much like Finland um, it had shared a little bit earlier, we have a similar development context in the US. Um, we had we had unbridled development of dams uh, in the 50s, early 60s, and so we have very few free-flowing rivers remaining. And we know that there are limited protections for those very few rivers that are left. And 
that terrestrial based protections like national parks are generally not adequate to address the specific needs of our freshwater ecosystems. And so I just wanted to walk through kind of a little bit of history behind the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act to protect those few remaining free flowing rivers. And um, in hopes of starting a conversation, I hope to hear from, from everyone um, after this call and after this meeting on ideas for improving the US system and also um, look forward to um, sharing these ideas with you where they might be effective in the European context. So in the 1950s, when we were in the era of unbridled dam development, there are a, a pair of brothers, the Craighead brothers, who were actually grizzly biologists in the Yellow, greater Yellowstone ecosystem and very familiar with the protections afforded to the first global national park, the Yellowstone National Park. And their hometown river was being threatened by a proposed dam, um, the Flathead river, river in Montana. And their thought was, why couldn't we translate this national park protection that was afforded to Yellowstone and um, preserved all of these values for the community economic um, drivers to, uh, to river systems. And if we did, what would that look like? And so they weren't unique to be having that conversation. These threats were being felt throughout the US. They were being felt throughout the world. And I think um, as I believe it was Corrine earlier had mentioned um, some legislation on the books in France for quite some time, just trying to figure out how to, how to address these threats and um, preserve our freshwater systems over the long term. So at that time, the Craighead brothers inspired and rallied folks from across the political spectrum um, to establish the National uh, Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So it was 1968, and at that time, um, through significant lobbying throughout the US, they were able to get support, I guess, again, across the political spectrum to declare a national policy that really complemented the the approach to infrastructure development and and uh, modernization with a policy for river protection and in that policy the the primary basis of the framework was that it would protect those rivers with outstandingly remarkable values and those values could include things like their recreational value um, unique geologic features their biodiversity uh, and historic and cultural significance. And that when they were protected, that the free flowing nature of that river would be inherent in the protection and the protection mechanisms and the immediate environments that contribute to the outstanding, uh, outstandingly remarkable values of that system would also be protected. And so, um, and another piece of the act was to immediately designate a series of wild and scenic rivers. So almost a dozen rivers were designated instantaneously and then a pathway for future designations was derived. And the eligibility for those future rivers to be considered are that they are free flowing and that they possess one or more uh, of the outstandingly remarkable values. And this system is managed through an approach, a cooperative government approach that includes federal agencies and state agencies that help to manage the existing system, promote growth uh, and inclusion of new rivers, and transfer best practices across the country. And the classification within the act includes three different areas. First, wild, um, then scenic, and recreational. So when establishing a new river, the River, the values of the river are assessed against these three cl classifications to see which is most appropriate for, for that specific river. And the suitability of that system is also assessed as test against, tested against the intentions of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, um, including questions like whether the values should be protected and whether, whether protection is the best method to achieve those values. And so 50 years, 50 plus years into the, um, after the passing of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, we're still including new rivers into the national system today. This image is of East Rosebud Creek in Montana. It was uh, designated just a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, and the local community recognizing the value of the river and 
and a threat of a proposed hydropower project. It was a pump storage project that was being proposed in this valley rallied together to go through the assessment process and categorize the remarkable values of this setting and get legislation passed to protect it in perpetuity. And so it's the combination of successes like this, the Walden Scenic Rivers Act, many of the successes that you've presented today and that we've seen in other parts of the world that combined with the urgency of the threats to our freshwater systems that led us to start thinking about filling the gap for a, for a global framework for durable freshwater protection. And so right now there is a lack of a global policy mechanism or framework for testing the durability of those policies for river protection. And so I'll just share a little bit about this framework and some of the um, early work that we're doing with partners around this framework. But um, in, in essence, the, the framework is meant to outline long-term opportunity, sorry, opportunities to protect rivers over the long term and really be contoured to focus on the unique needs of freshwater ecosystems. So it isn't enough to protect the system, the place itself. We also must protect the processes, which is unique from say a terrestrial system um, where in freshwater, in freshwater systems, as was alluded to earlier, we need to be thinking about sediment transport and water quality and hydro, the hydrologic cycle and um, unique biota that would transition in and out of a specific protected area and how those processes are supported to achieve the, the goals of the, or the designation. And then the last piece being needing a protection mechanism, something that will endure threats over time. And uh, in general, the framework is, it includes the three pillars that are reinforcing. Often when we think about protection, we think about the laws and policy piece. But again, I think as uh, Corinne alluded to a little bit earlier, it really is when these legal mechanisms are reinforced by local values for that place and a value, an economic value that you, create this virtuous cycle that leads to the durability of protection itself. And so a few key characteristics of the framework that we're, that we're drafting again with partners, I won't step through all of them, but just to say that each of these characteristics starts to tease out the three pieces, the legal, the social, and the economic to create a way to consistently assess the effectiveness and the durability of a protection measure. And just to outline a couple of mechanisms, and a few have been articulated today, but we have legislations or policies. So this would be something akin to the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, uh, a river basin compact. We have administrative designations and examples of those. So that would be something like a protected area that includes protection of the values of the river in that place. Um, acquisition of uh, enforceable water rights and land rights, and then judicial action, including um, things like the approach of uh, rights of nature approach, which is gaining traction globally. And so the, the last piece that I'll share is, is kind of completing the, uh, the <coughs> start, oh, I'm sorry, that's my dog. There's a very <laughs> threatening cat, cat outside, sorry. Sylvie, so um, that, that connects the restoration and protection cycle. I believe Henrik shared a little bit earlier the Penobscot Maine case study, where we worked with partners to um, remove a, a couple of hydropower dams on the lower section of the Penobscot River um, and include fish passage in the upper and in hydropower um, retrofits in the upper part of the basin. And to, again, kind of com to complete that cycle, the entire project opened up more than 2,000 miles of free-flowing river. And to, fall, to reinforce or abut that um, newly connected habitat, the state used the Clean Water Act to designate under, under the legislation of the Clean Water Act, the lower part of the river as permanently free-flowing. And so now, um, kind of again, buttressed by the Clean Water Act, that section of river will be protected in a free-flowing status um, in perpetuity. So 
with that, I'll just share what we're doing now and next steps. And again, invite um, anyone here or our folks that you know of that are interested in this topic to, to be in touch, to share your feedback and, um, and to learn more. So I'd mentioned we're working toward a global framework in partnership with others like IUCN, WWF and Conservation International um, and have sponsored a motion for World Conservation Congress specific to protecting rivers and their ecosystems as corridors in a changing climate. That, that motion also includes river restoration measures um, in addition to protection. And I wanted to mention that we're working with those same partners on curating a special issue in an upcoming journal of sustainability um, that highlights durable protections for free flowing rivers. And I believe a couple of folks on the call are submitting uh, papers for that special issue. So thank you for that. And with that, I'll uh, close and just invite any questions if we have time. And if not, for folks to feel free to email me with any, um, any follow-up thoughts. Hi Tara, thanks for that. That was really inspiring and thanks for joining us uh, early in your morning in, in the US. Um, Henrik, have you seen any questions or, or would anyone like to jump in and post one now whilst we have Tara on the line? I think it was a very inspiring, perhaps a complementary view to what we already have in legislation in, in Europe. Something that we should maybe think about as we look forward. We were talking about new ways to ensure better implementation of our directives and additional tools and such an approach might well be something of interest, I think. Uh, but is there anyone who would like to jump in? Um, I currently see one question from uh, Saya, which uh, is asking if, her, if you feel there are any challenges because of varying political will in certain areas or regions or you know, within stakeholders uh, and potentially having problems with uh, high level sort of no research attitude to, to the whole uh, designation question. Mm. Well, yes, in general, in the U.S. right now, <laughs> um, I'll say that. Uh, but specific to specific to river protection, I think what is um, unique about the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act because it does it does consider local uh, the local economics and the local social values when it when in the approach designation through the framework, you often find support across parties. And so that East Rosebud Creek example that I shared. That was actually signed into law, the designation was signed into law by the current administration, which um, doesn't often have in the political will for conservation um, measures. So I think that um, it is, we are not immune to those challenges by any means, but it, it has shown um, effectiveness through, through political changes. So thank you, it's a really important question. Okay, thanks. Uh very much for taking that question. We are, we are running a bit over time and I, I think I should give everyone a further break this afternoon so I don't see further questions now. Will, will you stay with us in case there are more questions, Tara? I'd be happy to. Thanks, Chris. Okay, well, let's see if anything further pops up. Now, now I'd like to move on to the next uh, presentation. That's going to be made uh, by Irma popovic Tuzmovic, if I've got that right. I'm sorry if I haven't. Um, Irma works for WWF um, Adriatic. I've lost her profile. Oh, goodness. Oh, here we are. She could also introduce herself, I guess. But um, she's indeed, um, from 2004, she's worked on freshwater issues, uh, mainly on sediment extraction, water policies, water framework directive, hydropower and freshwater habitats conservation. Um, she's a biologist by background, and she's going to talk to us about the Western Balkans, where we know we have some really fantastic rivers still. Uh, and uh, she's going to talk about their abundance and some of the threats they're facing. And that will come ahead of a, well, a tea break, but thereafter a panel discussion, talking about some of the wider policy developments and how they might influence the Balkans and their rivers. So uh, Irma, I'd like to give you uh, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, to the TNC and to the Wetlands International for giving me the opportunity to present uh, today uh, this presentation uh, and what we have actually in the Western Balkans. The, do you see my presentation? Yes, I do. Okay, okay, okay good. You're very clear. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, as I said, the, I'm coming from WWF Adria, and we are working in several countries from the Western Balkans. And um, I was asked to present uh, the, um, what we have here. And uh, everybody knows about Western Balkans, but uh, as soon as you come here and visit the countries, you are 
astonished because we are not so famous famous about the natural violence and what we have we are more famous about the uh, instable political uh, situation uh, um, uh, not so much developed economies and uh, you know all, all the time you know some uh, i would say negative uh, uh, news coming from our side but i will give you some uh, good uh, uh, information and nice information from the region so uh, we are actually uh, in a very good um, um, a natural position and geographical position because we uh, cover the region covers four biogeographical bio regions which is actually making all our countries very rich in biodiversity uh, maybe you know but uh, like uh, uh, the, the area was a refugee uh, in the in the ice age last uh, ice age so we have uh, very different uh, types of uh, uh, of uh, plants and animals uh, from the high mountain uh, representatives to the mediterranean uh, 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 mediterranean types and like hot climate representatives in the same time we have very different landscapes uh, like valleys different canyons karstic fields uh, 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 different kinds of uh, uh, lowland river wetlands, uh, uh, floodplain forests, uh, to the um, uh, last remaining Mediterranean wetlands uh, uh, representatives, like uh, Neretva Delta. Uh, as soon as we have these big uh, and different landscapes, we have different uh, uh, kind of species. Uh, many of them are endemics. Uh, we can easily say that like uh, especially with the cave fauna uh, where every actually uh, expedition going to the cave um, can discover one more species for the science uh, also very rich uh, in um, endemics of the fish and of the uh, mollusks and uh, uh, these uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in invertebrates but also some flora species so we have uh, um, many different uh, like rare and protected uh, species but uh, also we have a problem with the data uh, researchers are not uh, done uh, extensively and they are not uh, uh, um, not covering all the countries uh, very well especially we have problem uh, in albania with that and uh, in parts of Montenegro, for so for uh, so for some areas we don't have any data, and for some rivers, for instance, we don't have any data or very few data. Uh, uh, there are scientists; they are working, but still the the job is too big, and uh, you know there is a problem uh, uh, when we want to assess uh, uh, like uh, impacts of some projects, and we don't have uh, like uh, actual uh, data in our hands to say uh, what is going on uh, in and that at that site. As you may know, main threats are the hydropower, uh, mainly the ones uh, with the reservoirs, like a big hydro, but uh, also now we have a booming. Um, a small hydropower uh, 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 coming like with uh, uh, small dams but with the pipes so you can see uh, uh, kilometers of rivers without uh, water or very limited amount of water there and then there is a sediment extraction uh, gravel and sand where it's uh, used as a construction material and um, a very uh, easy to uh, get uh, usually without any or or with some very uh, bad uh, license and um, it's uh, good money to get uh, uh, good good things to get the money uh, then we have uh, the flood management measures like dams embankments uh, different kinds of retentions which are also um, you know um, degrading uh, freshwater habitats around uh, uh, we have a uh, of course pollution uh, mainly from the wastewater and solid waste this is uh, seen as one of the biggest problem for our uh, fresh waters because we like have a very big lack of uh, urban wastewater treatment plants and uh, so uh, the the um, uh, appropriate um, management of the waste and of course uh, some of the navigation and some of the agriculture is not that uh, as it's in uh, other parts of europe it's not that uh, big uh, of an issue uh, as for the you know, what we are currently doing as a conservation efforts 
we, uh, since there is this boom of small hydro, which are being subsidized by the countries through these uh, feed-in tariffs, and um, it's a very big business actually in our countries. So therefore, there is a big um, interest from the investors, and rivers are disappearing literally uh, in front of ours, our uh, eyes. Like for just to give you an example, there is um, an idea to build uh, uh, 15 hydropower plants in a row uh, on 25 uh, kilometers long river or 30 something like that. So it's 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 a it's a mess what is going on there. And one thing that we want to do, we want to stop subsidizing small hydro and uh, we are pushing our governments to just uh, skip uh, this and stop doing it uh, and then the interest for the small hydro development will decrease and we have this um, losingrivers.com uh, petition on ongoing now so i will use this opportunity to invite you to vote uh, to give your sign there uh, you will get information, more information on the site. Uh, also, as Tara mentioned, we are uh, very active in setting up a durable river protection for free-flowing free rivers in the region, uh, where we definitely want to keep the rest of the free-flowing rivers that we have, uh, uh, because there are still. Uh, and uh, we think that they definitely deserve a, a better uh, future than the ones uh, being turned into the series of small hydro or something else. Uh, also, we are very active in um, in implementation of the water frame directive in our countries, uh, and we are really promoting it as um, you know um, a good way to go and. Uh, uh, something that the goals of the water framework directive is something that we are actually uh, uh, advocating all the time and we are active through these integrated river basin management plans. Uh, uh, also, you know, we are very much uh, promoting the Western Balkans as a refugee of free flowing rivers, so we want to be on a global map as such, uh, uh, especially on the European map. As such, as you know, the, as we have heard, heard already, the situation in Europe is not good. Uh, situation in the Western Balkans, Balkans is a bit better in terms of uh, status uh, of water bodies, but uh, we still don't didn't assess it as uh, it is as it should be. Uh, so we don't know the uh, right number and the right percentage of the good or bad uh, status in the, our countries, but we just can say uh, like it's it's a bit better than in um, definitely in the uh, Western Europe. Uh, as well, we have um, we are doing a bit of uh, legal fighting on the national and on international level. We are discussing a lot with the Commission, European Commission, with the energy community, of course. So um, there are several uh, aspects of how we are uh, dealing with um, uh, and trying to uh, uh, get a better uh, uh, management of our uh, rivers and waters. Uh, and also, um, as you may know, there is a rising um, um, protests uh, of local peoples against small hydro development. Uh, and we are usually helping them from different uh, perspectives uh, to to get their right uh, to be heard uh, and uh, to help them to go to the court and stuff like this, because we really want uh, with uh, as one of the things that we are promoting is that uh, local consent is one of the uh, most important um, aspect of uh, any kind of development uh, 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 in the countries. So we, what was the situation in 2013? We then we did this uh, map. Uh, the map is showing the rivers and river reaches of most important for the, the Danar carp. Uh, the one in the dark blue are the most outstanding river reaches. The one in light blue are river reaches uh, important for the connectivity and the rivers in in. Um, Oh, uh, we have uh, still uh, another one that are that did not uh, have been assessed because of lack of data, but this was the situation in 2013, and I must say that it's a bit changed since then, uh, and not in a better way, because uh, since then there was some uh, uh, development of hydro uh, uh, done. 
uh, and when uh, it was done we could conclude that like 66 percent of the total river length analyzed is outstanding it means that it uh, has a certain uh, number of species that are, is protected or um, there is a, a hydromorphological state that it is being good or there is uh, i don't know land use suitable and uh, so there were some several um, criteria uh, used uh, and uh, uh, most of the 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 best situation was in montenegro uh, and then followed by croatia and then bosnia and herzegovina and then uh, albania and uh, 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 who had the same uh, amount uh, unfortunately, the data was not perfect, so some of the things were just done by the expert uh, judgment from our um, experts who did the analysis. Uh, but definitely what I wanted to show you with this, that we have really something to be proud of and that we really have something to uh, fight for uh, in our region in terms of uh, uh, still uh, uh, really, you know, in good uh, rivers in a good uh, status that uh, should be somehow uh, conserved. Uh, how do we see this uh, European uh, EU uh, the biodiversity strategy? We definitely see this as a new hope for us and something to hang on uh, because um, one of our main targets is, is to bend the curve of biodiversity loss, freshwater biodiversity loss. So. Um, we see the, the, the many of the, um, the actually the some things that we can definitely use from the biodiversity strategy is uh, the because the the strategy it says that it, they want to establish a network of freshwater species uh, protected areas uh, with that holds a high biodiversity and climate value and this is something that which we are doing with this durable river protection uh, mechanism of course, uh, to restore degraded ecosystems uh, across the region. This is something that we also are uh, promoting and trying to set up uh, in our countries. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that is probably the hardest one is that to get the transformation of the water management and energy sector, to use more the nature-based solution, to use more extension, to use more mitigation and impact minimization measures. Uh, unfortunately, our water management and energy sector are quite uh, old school, I would say, and they, they are not willing to change. So, um, you know, we sometimes has, have to be harsh to them <laughs> if, they, if we want to change them, uh, as they are like one of the oldest sectors um, and they will not change and they have a lot of money they are rich so they will not change just because they are you know good uh, uh, they we, we need definitely to push them in that direction so this is mainly it, what i wanted to present you and thank you for the attention and uh, we will see each other in the next uh, panel okay thanks very much Thanks very much, Irma. That was really beautiful images of some fantastic rivers and, and a real clear explanation of um, the pressures that these rivers are facing and, and what you guys and others within the region are trying to do to uh, prevent this. Um, obviously, compelling arguments to try and safeguard these rivers for the future. Um, there was one or two questions popped through. Um, we, we have a, another panel discussion in just a little over five minutes. Um, Maybe we could try to pick those questions up in the panel discussion. Would that be okay? Henrik, do you have any feelings on that? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, perfectly possible. Whereas, uh, yeah, it works. Out okay, because I can, I know you're going to be, so in the in the interest of giving everyone a five minute break, because it can be quite uh, a long run, these, these all day seminars, I'll give everyone a five minute break, take a drink, a stretch, and um, then at quarter to three, we'll start with a panel discussion, which uh, Henrik will be uh, facilitating, a short, a short chat with uh, three different panelists. So I'll leave you for now. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.
Hello again, everybody. We're back on track. Hope you've had a bit of a stretch and a, a break. Um, we want to move along quickly now. I'm, I'm not going to say too much because um, we're going to give the, pass the baton over to Henrik Osterblad, who's going to now lead a, a panel discussion. Uh, so, Henrik, I'll, I'll allow you to take that forward. Thanks very much, Chris. Yes, yeah, so uh, for this panel discussion, we have three panelists. Um, the topic we're discussing is the Green Deal, um, Green Agenda for the Western Balkans and what it means uh, for the region, including views from our panelists on the topic of uh, fresh water in relation to this said agenda. Uh, so without further ado, I'd introduce our panelists. We are only have 15 minutes, so it's a relatively short slot. But I'd like to welcome Madalina Ivanitsa uh, from the European Commission, who works as a coordinator for enlargement sector and DG environment uh, in the unit for bilateral, regional and international relations. And she also co-chairs the steering committee for the EU uh, Environmental Partnership Programme uh, for a session, or the EPPA, um, in, the, in the Western Balkans in Turkey. Uh, which aims to develop environmental governance through compliance with uh, environmental, uh, the EU environmental acquis. Uh, and then we have our uh, very own Irma from the session before, which uh, you already you already know. And then uh, we also have with us Nevin Trench. Please correct me if I say that name uh, mistakenly. Uh, and he comes from the um, uh, Croatian Ministry for Sustainable Development, uh, specifically the, the Institute for Nature Protection. Uh, as a geologist, uh, he's been working for roughly 20 years in the nature protection sector, um, as looking into the assessment and impacts of uh, water-related projects and river maintenance in relation to Natura 2000 areas as well, um, and especially in relation to the River Drava. Um, specifically. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I'd like to open up and just mention what the Green Agenda is to those who aren't too aware. So the Green Agenda is essentially a mirror of the uh, new European Green Deal, uh, which sets out to tackle several important, important topics, uh, including climate change, pollution, um, the biodiversity questions, and um, things like the green and just transition. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, the first panelist, which is uh, Marlina Ivanica. Uh, there are some questions which we uh, were going to ask. So the main questions around the green agenda is essentially how how you see the Green Agenda as an instrument for action on, on freshwater restoration and protection initiatives in the region. Um, exactly, more, more, more in detail how the Green Agenda can, uh, or what it can do for freshwater environments and biodiversity uh, in the region in the near future. So uh, please take it away, Madalina. Yes, hello. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to this very interesting event that took place uh, throughout the day. Um, I'm very happy to, to talk to you about the Green Agenda. Uh, thank you for introducing this uh, topic uh, in, uh, in your uh, event today. And thank you for coming to the Western Balkans as such, because I think this is a very interesting and very beautiful region uh, of Europe that deserves all our attention. But um, before I uh, start uh, dealing with the Green Agenda, just uh, maybe a few words at the beginning on what is it and um, how it came about that we have a Green Agenda for the Western Balkans. On the 6th October, the European Commission has adopted an economic and investment plan for the Western Balkans. And uh, we did this with the main aim to support the long-term recovery, economic recovery of the region and to foster uh, regional economic intervention. Um, so the, the European Commission wants to support a green a digital transition in the Western Balkans um, together with a sustainable new economic model that can bring benefits to the countries, both in economic terms, but also uh, in due respect uh, and um, protecting the environment. The countries need to implement the reforms required to move forward on the EU path. That's uh, that's a given, that's a must uh, in order to become EU member state and to get closer to the EU single market. This plan was even more necessary given the current uh, pandemic situation uh, when the COVID-19 um, is uh, having a massive disruptive effect on the economies of the world and uh, even more on the Western Balkans, which were already lagging um, behind in terms of economic convergence with the EU. 
and they uh, were facing and they are facing now due to this um, situation challenges um, from weak competitiveness, uh, high unemployment and structural weaknesses. We believe that um, the recovery process in the region, the same as for the EU member states, is a unique opportunity to take the leap forward and move from a traditional economic model to a more sustainable circular economy where resources, um, the use of resources is decoupled from economic growth. So in parallel to this economic and investment plan, the Commission has also put forward implementing guidelines for the Green Agenda in the Western Balkans. So the, the plan includes um, several areas, so he's focusing on several areas, energy, transport, digital, but also in, uh, environment. And in order to, to elaborate a little bit more the environment part of the, of the economic and investment plan, we put forward these uh, guidelines uh, in the form of a Green Agenda for the Western and Balkans. The Green Agenda is also uh, deliverable, um, presented in the European Green Deal, the communication on the European Green Deal, um, as we believe that the EU cannot achieve the sustainable transition uh, envisaged by the European Green without the closest neighbors joining in this process. And we also want the countries to align with the European Green Deal and to follow the EU on this path. Uh, moreover, as uh, EU future member states, the countries will need to align sooner or later with the EU key. They are already, of course, in the process of doing that. And since the EU key is uh, developing and is very dynamic and with the European Green Deal involves a lot of revised legislation in order to, to, to put the EU on the sustainable path, the, the um, Western Balkan countries will also have to uh, sooner or later also uh, change, make the transition and align with the new body uh, of Aki. Um, and from this perspective, we like the countries to start thinking now and to follow us on this now and not wait until uh, until later. The Green Agenda is uh, uh, expected to be adopted uh, at the Western Balkan Summit in Sofia uh, on the 10th of November, so in a few weeks' time. And as you mentioned already, uh, it foresees actions around five pillars, which are actually mirroring the European Green Deal. And the five pillars are climate actions, which include decarbonization, energy and mobility, circular economy, and here we look into uh, waste, recycle, recycling, sustainable production and efficient use of resources, biodiversity, uh, and here we aim to protect and restore the natural wealth of the region fighting air, water and soil pollution, and the last one, sustainable food systems and rural areas in line with the farm to fork strategy. Now, what does the Green Agenda say uh, in relation to water and biodiversity, which is actually the, the topic of your uh, meeting today? Um, everything that you have been discussing today and I followed uh, you throughout the day is very relevant. And the Green Agenda is one of the instruments to address some of the main challenges in the Western Balkans. Um, and uh, we are talking here uh, about West water management, nature protection and biodiversity. As uh, was very well mentioned by the colleagues um, from the civil society organizations uh, from WWF uh, Adria, uh, the, the region is um, blessed with pristine rivers still um, that have ecosystems and biodiversity that cannot be found anywhere else. And we want to, to make sure that this can be maintained or um, if, 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 there is a, if the rivers have been uh, destroyed or, um, or they are suffering uh, different uh, um, pressures on them, we, we, we should aim to come back to the, to the, to the situation that was before that. Um, and in order to achieve this, we have to address pollution and we have to aim to restore and protect the areas that have the potential to become Natura 2000 sites uh, later on once they, uh, they join the EU. More concretely on water, the Green Agenda recognizes that the Western Balkans um, are home to some of the last pristine rivers uh, of Europe, but their protection remains a challenge. Uh, remains a challenge. Um, there is a high share of population in rural areas with only basic sanitary facilities and wastewater collection, while urban areas with collection of wastewater via, via sewer, uh, sewer networks discharge mostly untreated wastewater. So that's a, a big pressure on the quality of water and uh, increased, uh, leading to increased pollution. 
There is also the risk of re release of nitrates and pesticides into the groundwater, which um, really need to be um, um, closely controlled. The main pressure on the quantity of the water are water extractions for industry, agriculture and public water supply. And a uh, unique challenge to the region's rivers that was also mentioned uh, today and also in, in the chat is a steep increase in hydropower capacity across the region as much as four times between 2015 and 2017. And this has significant environmental and social impacts, both at the country and the wider regional region. So the main task ahead uh, and uh, that the Green Agenda introduced is to, um, to help the country implement, first of all, the water-related legislation. So if the countries of the region will um, strictly um, implement uh, correctly uh, the environmental key in this, already the situation will be much better. But this requires more resources for investment in water infrastructure and in the government structures for sustainable water management, such as monitoring, reporting, planning, coordination among different uh, sectors, um, impact assessment capacity. So there is a lot of um, investment, human and financial, that uh, should be um, directed uh, to this uh, area. And uh, the Green Agenda proposes few initiatives um, that will be followed up uh, with uh, financing from uh, the instrument, the uh, instrument for pre-accession assistance, so it's called the IPA mining. But of course, what we present in the green agenda is not exhaustive. Um, there will be other initiatives and other needs that the countries will have, and uh, we aim to address this as much as possible uh, using the um, financial resources we have, but also in helping the countries uh, um, getting in touch with uh, with the, the different um, institutions to financial institutions or bilateral donors and so on. So in the area of water, we we are proposing the modernization of water monitoring infrastructure. A, this is the basis of the implementation of the water framework directive where we need to have um, first a good monitoring system in order to determine the um, uh, water status. And based on this, um, to, to be able to, to prepare the um, the measures to to manage um, the situation and to get to to get the waters to have uh, to be in a good status, then we also would uh, like them to implement the water framework directive, wastewater framework directive, and extractive waste directives. Um, these are directives that will lead to um, to depollution of waters and to um, bringing the, the, uh, the ecosystems and the biodiversity uh, in the waters in a, in a proper status. We would like, also like to, um, to support regional and bilateral agreements so that the water transboundary water pollution is dealt with, but also um, the land-based sources of pollution, for example, um, which is, uh, um, which is um, affected by the, by the uh, uh, improper waste management. Would like to, to see more investment in, in waste and manure management and wastewater treatment plants for use of water in agriculture. As as you know, uh, the the EU has uh, has just adopted um, a directive on the use of water uh, of wastewater in agriculture. So we'd like the countries to to align with us uh, in this, and we'd like to to see more investment in urban wastewater collection and treatment, including advanced treatment of nutrients. So um, the economic and investment plan for the region includes several flagship um, initiatives, um, among which um, for the area of environment, where it is already mentioned that um, the wastewater collection system um, and treatment plants will be financed um, uh, in order to, to have the region uh, more aligned with the URQ on this and to have them progress in this um, in this area. When it comes to biodiversity, we are also aware uh, that the region is contains a wealth of habitats and species, including a huge number of important endemic species. And uh, the Western Balkans should spare no effort to protect the biodiversity and the ecosystem services. Um, and this can be done through the alignment with the EU legislation. But we, we also know that the, there are many challenges, both at regional and national level, and those are related to the lack of political commitment. And uh, you already mentioned, some of uh, your guests already mentioned this um, today. 
So this lack of political will and commitment to improve the implementation of biodiversity policy, also the lack of financial resources and the impact of economic activities which take precedence over the protection of the environment. Well, for example, um, activities such as agriculture, forestry, fisheries, um, and to a lesser extent transport, tourism, and energy infrastructure developments have uh, a huge impact on, the bi on, on biodiversity. And many of the issues have been uh, already touched uh, upon uh, in, in the previous interventions today. Yeah, that's a very good, very good segue uh, to ask what the creation uh, side thinks of uh, all these topics that you brought up. I mean, Croatia being part of the EU, joining recently, uh, having been part of the accession process uh, with the implementation and um, uh, of the MRU EU environmental decree. So I'd like to ask uh, Nevin Trench if you have any comments on uh, what Madalena has brought up in terms of how the Green Agenda tackles freshwater, reflecting on your own experience from seeing uh, Croatia join the EU and, uh, and applying these, these measures, just uh, really, really briefly. Can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I mean, Croatia has one of the largest proportion of surface area in Natura 2000 network, above around 37%, which means that uh, green agenda is high on the agenda in general, and uh, our and it's it's been discussed and it's been analyzed in our. And it's been and, and sweet freshwater ecosystem have been specially emphasized as one important element, especially the restoration activities and uh, connectivity. And uh, there have been several restoration projects that have been done before, uh, uh, mostly by water management se sector in real and. And they all try to incorporate also water management and biodiversity. And now we are trying to, we are very connected. There have been, uh, Ima also knows there has been also one project on the Rava where we are lear learning how is the best way to restore rivers and to um, enable them to improve the other functions. And right now we are also working on, the, on, a, on another project which should be integrated life that should involve uh, 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 guidelines for restoring connectivity for the removal of dams and also for and also include some some pilot projects and uh, and these are the also we are make, making steps in the management of Natura 2000 so these are the areas that are the I would say the currently hottest topic uh, so I, I would say we are really this freshwater ecosystems are really something that we are rich. We have a Pannonian region with, with, with flatland rivers, we have mountains, we have a Mediterranean zone with these shorter but very uh, rich karstic rivers. So we have to find strategy for all these different freshwater ecosystems, how to improve them, how to make them better. We see, I have to say, in Europe we have millions of obstacles really. And we are just doing them one by, by one. So after these pilot projects, I think, think in the next period, we should go more to the basin approach to solve one basin by, by the other. But it all depends on the funding and on the other situation. A wholesale approach indeed. Uh, do you think the rest of the region can, can see and learn from Croatia in terms of uh, the green agenda? Uh, and moving forward with things like biodiversity restoration and protection measures, not only in the EU context, but also in the global context with the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, do you think it's... I'm sure, I, I hope, yes, in some, in, in some aspects, in some aspects we are, we are learning from others. It's uh, my experience that, these, that while you have general approaches, each restoration pro pro project is very specific, each removal of them is very specific, and then you have to look into the situation that that's why you can learn from neighbors because they would have the similar ecosystem similar problems similar solution so i'm sure we can we can learn from each other sounds great i'd like to turn to uh, irma popovic for some final final comments and reflections on what you heard and also uh, if you have anything else to add please please do so as well well, thank you, Henrik. You know, I, what I would like to stress really here uh, as a final maybe wording of this panel is that uh, a region is, as we always said, very rich in biodiversity and we, we really have something cons to conserve, but we lack protected areas, protected uh, places 
we have paper parts, unfortunately, so they are um, not being uh, literally protected. They are just there to, you know, to uh, for the promotion and also we la lack a little uh, enforcement of the laws. So we can say that we have more or less okay laws. Uh, we have a pro um, access to the European Commission and stuff like this, but the law enforcement is really bad uh, and very low. Uh, so as for the green uh, agenda, you know, these commitments uh, uh, we propose to be legally binding uh, because uh, countries are very prone not to respect uh, regulations or try to skip them. So uh, if they are legally binding, then they will take them more seriously. And also uh, there is a need to full involvement of the countries in the process of changing because every change is um, hard, uh, it can be painful. <laughs> Uh, so if you involve them, if, if you involve the countries from the beginning and try to uh, design it um, uh, by together with them, it will definitely be uh, easier. And uh, also it's about taking responsibilities for it's not pushing something. It's like together, we, we build it together. And also we, you know, our responsibility is from the both sides, not just the EU, but also from the countries and vice versa. Uh, and I really ask uh, the, the Commission to, to, to be more proactive in, in, um, in approaching the countries and in trying to solve uh, all the current environmental issues uh, that we see, especially with the uh, uh, freshwater habitats. Some, some great words there. Uh, great. I mean, thank you everyone for being on this panel and, and uh, facilitating the discussions. It's been great to hear from all of you. Um, Certainly the Western Balkans is a really pristine uh, area in terms of fresh water and let's hope that the Green Agenda, uh, as we heard, things are coming to a close in November, uh, that this will uh, lead to some great things. So um, unfortunately we're a bit over time, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to thank our panelists again and I'll uh, hand over to Chris Baker uh, so you can introduce our next speaker, who is Claire Baffert, uh, who's going to speak on the EQ resolution of the water framework directly. So thanks again and uh, look forward to further thank discussion. You. Thanks very much, everyone. That was very interesting. Interesting to hear the opportunities are there, but also the, the challenges to, to make a green deal and the green agenda uh, land in the Western Balkans. Um, now we have um, one more, if you like, set piece uh, presentation before we have some uh, rounding off of the day in terms of uh, concluding comments. We uh, go to Claire Buffett, um, who is the Senior Water Policy Advisor at WWF in the European Policy Office. Uh, and she's also the chairperson of the Living Rivers Europe Coalition, a group of NGOs working on rivers at the European level. Uh, she's a strongly interested in climate and environmental issues, expertise, and knowledge of EU policies and processes, and with working with local authorities. And, and Claire's going to talk about what I understand is a, a resolution in the European Parliament on how to improve the implementation of the Water Framework Directive. And I, I hope that gives us some clues as to how some of the good points and ideas that have come through discussion so far can can find a place in some concrete propositions going forward. So Claire, I hope uh, you're ready. Yeah, Hi, you thank you very you. much for the introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. Can you see my first slide now? Yeah, that's, that's fine, great. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the for the introduction and for this invitation. Um, let me start by presenting uh, very quickly the Living Rivers Europe Coalition. Um, so we uh, are a coalition of five, uh, six, sorry, environmental um, NGOs uh, active in freshwater conservation: the European Environmental Bureau, the European Rivers Network, the European Anglers Alliance, Wetlands International, the Nature Conservancy, and WWF. Um, and basically our objectives are uh, a better implementation and enforcement of the Water Framework Directive, um, an effective integration of water management into sectoral policies, in particular agriculture, energy, uh, flood management and transport, and the maintenance of the Water Framework Directive's high standards, um, which has been our main uh, focus over the past um, years. So I've been indeed invited to talk about the European uh, Parliament resolution on the implementation of the water legislation, um, which is uh, currently under uh, preparation in the Parliament. 
it's a very timely one because it follows um, the fitness check of the two pillars of the EU water legislation, the WFD and the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. Um, in, I mean, the conclusions were, were uh, released uh, last year. And um, there are also two oral questions to the Commission and the Council that has, have been adopted uh, earlier in September that uh, ask really quick key questions uh, with regards to the um, improvement and the uh, enforcement uh, of the water legislation. In such a, it's interesting to note that uh, in 2012, the Parliament already worked uh, on a resolution on the implementation of the water legislation. And actually, if you see uh, the key points from the two um, resolutions, it's quite similar. It's about implementation that has been too slow, uh, too uneven, uh, and it's about how to um, significantly improve the implementation to achieve the good water status. So, um, I mean, in, in this regard, I think the question is how can, uh, can the Parliament make this uh, new resolution uh, make a difference? Um, I'll, I'll go very quickly on that slide because a lot of this has been said earlier today, but uh, yeah, 60% of EU surface water bodies are still not in good status. Hydromorphological pressures uh, are the biggest pressures on surface uh, waters. And the fitness check conclusions have pointed out uh, three obstacles to the achievement of WFD objectives, which are insufficient funding, slow implementation, and insufficient integration um, of environmental objectives in sectoral policies. Um, so I think it's, it's very positive that uh, the parliament addresses the key question of implementation uh, in the oral questions and, and resolution. And it has pinpointed some essential issues, um, such as how to secure the necessary funding for water measures, uh, how to improve the integration of the directives in sectoral policies, um, how to address the variations in the implementation between member states, how to better uh, apply the user and polluter based principles, and how to address the overuse uh, of exemptions in the third cycle of river basin management plans. Um, and I would also say this resolution is very timely as well because we are coming um, to uh, the end of the second uh, cycle of river basin management plans. Uh, it will end uh, at the end of 2021 and at that time um, the member state authorities also have to release their plans for the third cycle. So um, the resolution is also timely in that uh, regard. Um, However, we, we also think that the resolution of the parliament should be really much um, tougher and contain clearer messages um, on, on how to address the key drivers of freshwater ecosystems degradation. Uh, and those are hydromorphological changes and diffuse pollution mainly. Um, and this requires to address really um, the impact of specific sectors, such as hydropower, such as navigation, um, such, such as uh, agriculture as well. Um, on, on hydromorphology uh, and its impacts, a lot of uh, the indicators are in the red, uh, and therefore the resolution should really be um, uh, a warning call to the European Commission and to the member states. I'll go quickly again uh, through those slides because a lot of this has been said already earlier today, but 93%, this is the, um, the appalling statistics about the decline of migratory freshwater fish populations in Europe since 1970. It's worse in Europe than in any other continent. Um, Europe has already lost most of its large free-flowing rivers. They are indicated um, in blue on that map, and you can see there is very little blue uh, on, on the map of Europe here, even though, as my colleague Irma said, the situation in the, in the Western Balkans is a bit better than, than elsewhere. Um, and despite this, uh, thousands of hydropower plants are on the cards. The new plants uh, appear in red in this, uh, in this map, and you can see uh, a lot of plant plants um, in the Iberian Peninsula, in the Alpine region, and in the Balkans. So coming back to, to hydromorphological changes, um, I think uh, the Parliament in its resolution uh, should send a clear message 
um, that barrier development runs directly in contradiction to the WFD objectives and to the objectives of the, um, uh, the biodiversity strategy. So um, on hydropower, it is important to recognize the environmental impacts of hydropower and um, to send the message that public finance for new hydropower plants should be redirected to uh, the refurbishment of existing plants to make them more efficient, to increase their output, but also to mitigate their environmental impact. On navigation, the European Green Deal forces um, a shift um, from, uh, from um, road uh, freight to inland waterways uh, freight. And this threatens the integrity of rivers as well. So it's important that um, the resolution also sends the message that uh, this should be fully in line with the non-deterioration principle of the Water Framework Directive and uh, also in line with other environmental legislation such, such as the Birds and Habitats Directive. On dams construction, uh, very important also to uh, that the Parliament calls on the Commission to work with Member States to achieve the um, commitment of 25,000 um, kilometers of free-flowing river restoration. And uh, I would insist that this uh, should also be done in time um, before the third uh, river basin management plans are out. Otherwise, we're missing uh, th this, this essential planning opportunity. On the cost recovery principle, um, we need stronger wording in the resolution on the implementation of the cost recovery principle. Um, it is not an optional uh, principle. And um, as pointed out by the commission in their report on the implementation of the second river basin management plan, it should really be applied to all water use activities. And this uh, includes, according to the Commission, impoundment, abstraction, storage, treatment, distribution of surface waters, um, and also all the collection, treatment, discharge of wastewater. So um, it's, it's really important that, um, that the, the, the resolution also calls on uh, the implementation of this principle to all uh, water users, because this can also help um, bridge the finance gap in the implementation of the WFD. Diffuse pollution should be uh, tackled as well with proper integration um, of water in the CAP strategic plans and this should involve not only nutrient uh, management as currently proposed but also um, pollution control more generally and also uh, natural water retention um, measures. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Um, this brings me to nature-based solutions. They also need to be um, to be uh, properly boosted, uh, and this means adjusting um, the the funding and the financing streams uh, related to water management um, away from the traditional engineering um, principles uh, towards uh, really nature-based solutions. And I think for that, the Zero Pollution Action Plan is an opportunity, um, also probably the climate uh, adaptation strategy. So um, I think all, all the messages here that I've, I've shared have one thing is in common, and this thing is political will. Um, at the moment, there is simply not enough political will to prioritize um, the, the freshwater ecosystems. And I think this is um, a symptom, uh, a symptom that there is not enough understanding at political level of how important freshwater ecosystems are. And, uh, and they are important to our life. Uh, and in this regard, I, I like a lot the title of this event, Rivers as Lifelines, uh, they're important to our health and to, and to the planet. So uh, I think there is still a need to make this case and to bring those arguments uh, on the importance of those ecosystems. Um, in the debate, and I really count on the Parliament to um, to pass that uh, that message. So I've put here on the last slide um, the hashtag that we are using EP for WFD um, to communicate about this uh, resolution. Feel free to to follow it. Feel free to use it. Um, and thank you for your attention. Uh -huh. Thanks, Claire. That's really great. 
uh, very clear explanation of uh, what's uh, being thought of around this resolution. Just a, a quick question, because we have still you know, 30 odd people online who all shared their ideas and uh, some points in the discussion boxes. Is, it, is there a way that Living, Europe, River, Living Rivers Europe is going to, um, can, can ideas be sent to you or further discussion around this resolution take place? Because I'm sure people would have a lot to share with you if, if they're not already doing so. Um, sorry, I'm not sure to understand the question. You mean, will we organize um, yeah. a discussion or? Is there um, space to take new, new ideas or additional ideas forward from this event or from uh, further discussions afterwards? I mean, um, we haven't planned a specific event uh, as, as the coalition, but of course people are free to contact us. Uh, my email address is, is there. Um, and I think there are a couple of, of green uh, week other events organized by some partners of the coalition. So. Yeah, if, if some of my colleagues here want to say something about them, um, feel free. Okay, no, thanks very much. Just uh, for, my, for my interest as well, actually. Um, okay, we've, um, I think, run through most of the set piece discussions. Henrik, do we have any, sorry, before I go too far, do we have any further questions that we might want to put up in response to Claire's presentation? Uh, we do not have any specific questions I can see in the chat at the moment referring to this to Claire's presentation. Uh, we did have some questions for Irma. Unfortunately, she's no longer with us. Yeah. Um, so we can start maybe drawing this conference to close if people don't have any, any other inputs we, uh, we could tackle just now. If anybody has any ideas or any further questions to any other speakers or, or us as organizers as well. Okay. Well, we'll, um, we'll take on to the, the rounding up now, as you say. Um, the first person, well, the main person, I should say, who's going to be doing that is Marianne Kleiberg. Um, she joined the Nature Conservancy in 1999, where she began uh, nearly a decade managing the Gulf of California program in Mexico. Uh, she's now the Regional Managing Director for the Nature Conservancy's Europe program. Uh, and immediately prior to that, she was the Director of Conservation and Deputy Director for the Conservancy's Caribbean program. So we have someone with a wide and broad experience who's now really bringing some of that to the table in Europe. Welcome, uh, Mariana. You've been given the unenviable task of bringing some summary points together from this, this whole day of presentation. So I'd like to give you the floor. And after that, then I have the pleasure of closing the meeting. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you all for participating in this event so enthusiastically all up to the end. Uh, it's been a long virtual day. I think when I saw at least 42 participants at one point, um, and I know there was an overbooked event, and that really shows the relevance and the urgency of the topic. I'm very pleased to have such a great partner as Wetlands International to co-organize the event. So thank you, Chris, for your excellent facilitation as well. And I'm pleased to see such a wide range of speakers and audience, uh, ranging from policymakers, private sector, NGOs, and participants dialing in, both from various regions in Europe, as well as colleagues from outside of Europe. Now, starting off with the presentation this morning, actually to Claire's last presentation, we had references to the science and the facts that show that freshwater ecosystems are in crisis. Freshwater biodiversity is in free fall, and numerous reports point out that they're effectively collapsing, that we are in the 24th hour. So with that backdrop, it is really encouraging to see that the EU is so committed to restoring and protecting freshwater as well as making huge strides in protecting terrestrial and marine areas. So we applaud the EU for making such a bold commitment to conservation through the biodiversity strategy, even amidst the global pandemic. And we welcome the strategy for bringing together both strong protection and restoration ambitions. As Irma said in her presentation earlier today, the EU biodiversity strategy is our new hope. The Council, by endorsing such an ambitious strategy, would show the member states and the global community that Europe means business, that we don't have any more time to waste, and that Europe is stepping up its global leadership, and that this is our decade to act. At the Nature Conservancy, we stand for real and practical solutions, some of which you've heard about today in the presentations, and we're looking for solutions that benefit both nature and people in a holistic manner. And we encourage the Commission, Member States and the Parliament to draw up a freshwater future for Europe that includes networks of healthy and resilient freshwater systems. 
as many of the European rivers as we've had are shared by two or more countries, restoration efforts should also be shared and coordinated among countries. Pollutions don't stop at the borders and neither does river connectivities or species migration. So by working at cross-country level, we can ensure that we're committing to now that the protection of future generations benefit and enjoyment across boundaries. It would also be ideal to see that the various EU policies and strategies can work towards the same outcome. So that the protection, the restore targets of the biodiversity strategy, the objectives of the Water Framework Directive and the Habitat Directive can be treated in a complementary manner so that they're mutually complementing each other. Now we share a vision, I think we all in this group here today, to see restored, protected, free-flowing rivers across the continent. Now we recognize that this is a huge undertaking. I think, however, that based on experiences from other parts of the world, including the US that you heard about today, we know that investment in restoration and protection can have both high financial returns, high social returns, as well as high ecological returns. And that gives us hope. Our mission in Benetic Conservancy is to protect land and water upon which all life depends and to create a world in which nature and people thrive together. And I think this is what we've been hearing all throughout the day. We need to do this work for us, for nature, for people together. And we want to walk the talk. So uh, we are here to offer our assistance, uh, both in the policy arena, as well as using real life demonstration cases from around the world and practical solutions so that this can come to life on the ground. So with that, I uh, said so I'm very encouraged um, from what I heard today from all the presentations and that there's so much interest right now in bringing freshwater issues back to the forefront where they deserve to be. As the title of the presentation said in the beginning, the rivers are a lifeline. Um, so with that, uh, thank you everyone again for engaging. Um, we are not gonna stop engaging. This is the start of a long journey. And with that, I will pass it on to Chris again for another closing. And thank you, Chris, again for wonderful facilitation and also Henrik uh, for your work. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, Marianne. That's really nice words. I think you've made a fantastic job of uh, pulling together what's been quite a, a diverse set of issues and presentations today and giving us some, some clear food for thought. I, I thought walk the talk is a very nice way to put it. We've had uh, policy and intentions on the table for many years now as the previous speaker also highlighted and we still face maybe some of the same problems as we had 10 years ago so um really walking the talk is something i think we i really do believe we have to do in the years to come um i don't think i will attempt to capture the whole discussion further today um for myself i've been involved in on and off in european rivers for many years i've heard lots of issues i've maybe heard before but i've heard also uh, seeds of hope and comfort New ways of looking at financing, I find that very exciting because I think that gap has been a huge problem in the future. Uh, and I think a clear recognition that a lot of uh, policy and, and strategy is very useful, but actually in the end it comes down to communication and winning people over. Also political will, as I think was just mentioned. So I'd like to leave the group with those thoughts and uh, unless Henrik or Eif have any further comments, housekeeping or otherwise, <laughs> uh, perhaps in terms of the follow-up, what do you plan to do? That might be nice. I'm looking yes, at Eve. Um, maybe I can say a few words yeah. about uh, how we move on from here. Um, as some people have been asking whether the presentations uh, will be uh, shared afterwards. So yes, I'd like to point that we will uh, upload the, the slides of the speakers to the Wetlands International Europe website, but we'll make sure to share the link with you. Um, and we have recorded this event, so we will uh, upload the recording so if you've missed out on any any of the sessions you you can always uh, have a look uh, back at the event um, and of course so so there have been uh, good questions and, uh, uh, and interesting um, views shared through the chat box so I wanted to say that that I've, I've saved all those uh, uh, all, like all those messages that you've shared um, and we will uh, integrate those in in, um, in uh, publishing the okay. the main messages from from this event so there will be some uh, uh, follow-up uh, in next week um, where you can find the well all the information shared uh, today 
Um, Henrik, is there anything uh, you would like to add to that? Yes, I'd just like to add uh, to Chris and, and Eve's words that, first of all, thank you all the speakers. And, you. Uh, I'm Henrik. At least I can't. Oh, hang on. No, yeah. I can't. It's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, again, really thank you for, for those of you who participated and spoke. It's been very interesting to hear what you had to say, and uh, especially in terms of the topics we've managed to cover in this relatively short time period. I mean, for some, maybe quite a long day, but it's been very, very interesting. And uh, so thank you again for, for choosing to, first of all, attend and participate. Uh, and we hope that we can continue this conversation with, with most of you um, at a later date as well. So uh, please watch this space, as Marianne covered as well. It's certainly a very important area, uh, the area of uh, river restoration and freshwater protection. So we hope that you uh, keep your interest keen and uh, will be with us for the rest of the uh, travels in this area as well. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, hope you have a great afternoon as well. Yeah. Thanks, Henrik. Thanks, Eif. Thanks also from me. Um, thanks to TNC and to the uh, Europe office for hosting this. It's a great to see such a cooperation happening, I think. Uh, thank you to the speakers. You did a great job. Most of you kept really great to time and even the ones that went over didn't do so badly, I think. Um, and thanks to the participants. You've stayed with us for the most part right the way through, which is really remarkable. And you've continued to post interesting points and issues throughout, which is really great. So with that, I'd like to uh, close the session. And as Marianne said, let's walk the talk. Thank you very much. Bye bye.